site? No, just the just the factory floor. Okay, the appointed time has arrived. Um, welcome to the January 15th edition of the MBE committee. Um, we have a, a packed agenda. I hope you've, you've had a chance to read through a lot of the documents, maybe all of them that are on the website that have, have trickled in over the last um, couple of days. Um, so let's do a roll call, see who's here. Okay, Chell Anderson. Present. Caroline Traub. Here. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Bayruther. Here. Tony Doan. Peter Rieke. Here. Katie Sheehan. So we do have a quorum. All right, great. Uh, thanks for, for being here today. Um, as I mentioned, we have a packed agenda. Does anybody from the public want to be recognized? If so, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, just say your name and affiliation. Patrick Hayes, Technical Advisory Group voting member on the Energy Code TAG. Thanks, Patrick. Damon Doyle. Our presenting oh, sound transit. Good to see everyone. Hello. All right, thanks. And Damon Doyle um, from the council is also here. That was overlapping with um, sound transit. Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, Nancy Bernard, Washington State Department of Health, Indoor Air Quality Specialist. I'm on the mechanical ventilation tag and here to support two of the proposals. Thanks, Nancy. Larry. Larry Andrews, Andrews Mechanical. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Kevin. Kevin Dewell with Northwest Natural, member of the Residential Energy Code tag. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Jeanette. Jeanette McCaig with Washington Realtors, member of the TAG or Energy TAG. Thanks, Jeanette. Greg Davenport. Greg Davenport, Mitsubishi Electric, and also an Energy TAG member. Thanks, Greg. Gavin. Gavin Tennell, Northwest Renewables, also an Energy Code TAG member. All right, big representation from the Energy Code TAG today. Um, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer Kane with Train Technologies. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, anybody else want to introduce themselves from the public? Carolyn Logue is here for Washington Air Conditioning. Thanks, Carolyn. There's Northwest Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association. Elliot. Elliot, I can't hear you. You might be the Elliot one. Brown, Council of Supply, here for public interest. I can barely hear somebody talking right there. Johnny. Uh, Johnny Kutcher, RMI, in support of a few proposals. It's Johnny, Mark. Mark Wassler, uh, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, also here in support of the two proposals. Thanks, Mark. And then Elliot, do you wanna? Sounds don't supply, is Elliot Brown, don't supply, here for public interest. Thanks, Elliot. Okay, so we have a, a packed house in here as well. We have 36 people. Um, okay. Well, uh, let's get started. Um, going to review and approve the agenda. So we see the agenda in front of you. Anybody want to comment on the agenda and make modifications? Okay, I'll take a motion. To Go ahead, Damon. Um, Mr. Chair, I wonder if it might be possible to move item five above item four so that the proponents don't need to sit through the whole meeting. 
could definitely be possible. Um, yeah. Um, okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda with item modified uh, for Damon's suggestion um, or, or another motion if somebody would rather. So move the agenda, approval of the agenda as amended. Okay. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion, we have a second. Is there further discussion on this, on approving the agenda as modified? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, we have an agenda. Uh, first item is, or the next item is to look at the meeting minutes from our last meeting. Okay, anybody move to uh, approve this thing or modify it? Move to approve the meeting minutes from April 7th. Second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Is there further discussion? Okay, all in favor of approval of the meeting minutes, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. Um, and I did forget to do this earlier. Um, the way we're going to take uh, comments today is through raising hands. Um, so there's a feature on your Zoom where you, under reactions where you can raise your hand and then um, I will write you down on a list and then I will go in the order in which I see hands raised. Um, if for some reason you, you need to speak and you either can't raise your hand or you feel like you've had your hand raised and I haven't called on you, just unmute and, and ask. Um, to make a comment. We've had some people that are, for whatever reason, unable to raise their hand because they're on the phone or something like that. Okay, so now we are on to the request for emergency rule, proposed temporary heat pump efficiency reduction language. Um, Carolyn, are you going to introduce this? Yes, I can. So um, I'm not sure how many, I'm pretty sure everybody probably on the MVE tag heard this at the last State Building Code Council meeting. Yeah. Um, have to on behalf of the uh, Washington Air Conditioning Contractors Association, which is residential HVAC contractors, we have asked for some relief uh, because of supply chain issues, getting at, at getting the 11.0 HSPF um, heat pump systems. There just aren't that many of them. Um, we had a previ previous proposal. We were asked to go back and look at it again. So we did meet with several people. Um, our group went through and also looked at what could we do to increase the supply while still trying to maintain the goals of the energy code um, for 2018. And we also looked at the timing. So you'll see in our letter that we look at what we want to do now is allow a 10.0 HSPF system to qualify for the 1.5 credits provided that the unit is in inverter driven and includes at least one of the following things along with it. And this would be in addition to the other 406, R406 credits. Um, I, I could read them all, <laughs> or do you think everybody has them in front of them? Um, but it basically it's, it's different things that could be done for the envelope option 1.4 times, a 22% reduction in the envelope UA, um, use the appliance credit, but not require the dryer or change the dr dryer requirement to a CEF of 3.93 or higher, which would capture most, if not all of the energy start vent vented dryers. Upgrade the tier three HPWH to a tier four, and that would be unitary non-split system. Upgrade the gas tankless water heater to a UEF of 0.095 or higher, or the system is listed on the NEAP cold climate HSHP database. Um, we look back, we think, first of all, by doing this, go just moving to the 10.0 opens up a whole new world of systems that are available uh, from the supply perspective. And each of these options allows multiple manufacturers to be involved as well. So it's not, you're not, some of them, if you just did one, like the cold rated, you'd be limiting to just only a couple manufacturers. We wanted to broaden it as much as possible. Our goal would be to have this be, it would have to be an emergency for to start, but to do a, a permanent rulemaking 
that puts this in effect until the 2018 code no longer is viable and we move to the 2021 code. Um, so it would be good until June 30th, uh, 2023. And this would be for anything permitted under the 2018 code. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I guess an initial question just on, um, so a 10 HSBF system under the 2018 code qualifies for one credit, but not one and a half credits. Exactly. Right. So there's a half credit that is what you're trying to make up here, yeah, right? Exactly. And that's, and, that would be adding one of those other options on there with it. And so these other options, are they each worth a half a credit? That's our understanding. When I, I, I it was Dan Whitehouse, I believe, from, uh, and he worked with us on this, and he feels pretty good that we would be achieving the same goals. And I guess these are not credits within the table right. as it currently exists, but right. they the would addition. save a, in, in your understanding, an equivalent amount of energy, a 600 kWh per half credit, which is. Uh, what we're trying to make up here is a half credit. That is our understanding, yes. Okay. It may not be absolutely perfect, but it's pretty close. Okay. And then um, I had emailed you some questions, and one of them was, would this apply to, in, in your ideal world, would this apply to permits that have already been issued, and therefore people who are in the process of building a home and just can't get the equipment yeah. in the next couple months, versus new permits that are going to be applied for perhaps in a month where there might be a year from completing the house or or eight months from completing the house or, or something like that. So We'd you're- like it you're, to apply to both if we can, just because okay. we're running into such problems. Okay. All right. That's, I just wanted to kind of help frame the question for everybody. So Damon, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that these, uh, these five options or five additions uh, were developed by Dan Wildenhouse at NIA. And uh, during the discussion, he did say that he felt that each was equivalent to half a credit. Okay, great. Um, Caroline, go ahead. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I have a couple, a couple items to bring up here. I guess, first of all, I am, I have some questions about the use of an emergency rule, I guess, an emergency rules for the preservation of the public health, safety, or general welfare, and that observing the time requirements of notice and opportunity to comment upon adoption of a permanent rule would be contrary to the public interest. So, I mean, thinking about that criteria, whether this is impacting um, public health or safety, probably not. So maybe it's a question of whether it's about general welfare. And then I guess further, if it is impacting general welfare, I'm curious about whether the public would want to weigh in on this um, such that a, a different mechanism that allowed for public comment other than an emergency rule um, might be warranted. And I think you know, looking at the the other emergency rules this council approved for the residential energy code in the past year, um, there's two of them. So the one allowing for fireplaces to use continuously burning pilot lights, and that's section R40313. And then the other one um, regarding the certificate of occupancy not being withheld pending the installation of the outdoor unit, um, and that impacts R10425. And so both of those rules apply to prescriptive or mandatory, you know, portions of the energy code where there's not really a choice of whether to comply or not. Um, and in this case, we're, we're talking about a, a choice in an options table where each project can kind of choose their own adventure. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just curious about um, kind of some of those thoughts on if this is the the right mechanism. 
Well, so to the emergency aspect of it, um, first of all, similar to the uh, option, the uh, certificate of occupancy one, we've got a problem with people not able to get these systems. They're trying to reach that, uh, the 1.5 energy credits, they've already sort of built that into the construction. We think that's important also for being able to go forward with an ener energy efficient home and they're unable to finish. So the emergency part of this um, is to probably more for those that are already permitted and being allowed. Um, and similar to the other ones, it's about getting somebody into their home with an appropriate um, energy efficient heating system, which we do, do think that is in the general welfare of the public in terms of the public that are trying to um, buy houses and have, and have housing. And that's why this is going to have to be done in two pieces, because then you have to move into the regular rulemaking in order to make it extend to June 30th, 2023. Um, which therefore would allow for additional public comment on extending it beyond just the 120 days of an emergency rule. I guess the question Caroline brought up of whether this qualifies as an emergency rule is one that the MVE can consider, the council can consider, and then I don't know if we need um, input from, I don't know, attorney general or, or I'll, their office or, or others, because you bring up good points as it qualifies an emergency rule is at, at some point a legal question. Um, but I think we we have purview to discuss it today. So I guess I don't know how. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great comment. And I think we can focus on um, if there were to be some sort of change, what the um, what that might look like. So thanks. Good point. Thanks, Todd. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for bringing this forward. And I appreciate this work and, and help help educating those council members that are not in subject matter expertise in this area. Um, I do appreciate this list. I, I so two things. I, as I've expressed in the past, I do share that concern that we're using emergency rulemaking, even though I've probably voted for some of those uh, previous emergency rulemaking at the council level. I. I that, that, is, that concerns me, but I think the question of permitting and, and other alternative pathways is, is um, maybe more on, on my mind. Um, I didn't hear an answer to, you know, at that last time we talked on the other proposal that these are for new permits. So things that, you know, are already potentially bumping up against, you know, the July 1st implementation next year or, or could be, right? That's still a year away, but so that's my question of how effective would this really be? Um, and then, you know, in the structural world, we would look at when we would need to have, a, when we have a supply constraint and we would need to propose an alternative to something that's already permitted. And of course we would take a different pathway for that with the local jurisdiction. It, are we saying there are absolutely no alternative means and methods or other, other um, pathways to make substitutions and, and and those kind of judgments at the at the local level, and and I, I say that as a, as an honest question outside of my area area of expertise. Thank you. Well, my understanding is that in I'm trying to remember the first the first part of it, but in in building in those kind of alternative pathways, what we're trying to do is make this a valid one. I guess when we're dealing with these changes and you know in the emergency rule aspect of it, unfortunately, because these are rulemaking. This is the only way we can deal with changes and things that occur during the time that these codes are, are available. So I, I know it's not unusual for the St State Building Code Council to go and do an emergency rulemaking or change some things midstream. But this is, this is kind of the problem we run into. And we're hoping that some of this discussion will feed over into the discussion on the 2021 en energy code. So there can be some uh, additional allowances for how can you make a system meet the 1.5 uh, and do some other things. And I think there have been some things discussed in the energy code going forward, particularly using cold rated. Um, so we're hoping that this is, is part of a discussion that supply chain is going to be an issue in this environment for some time and, and the ability to sort of allow even more flexibility and perhaps even the options codes table um, is, is very important. What we're trying to do is say, we think we can get because the builders and everybody want to get, they want to be able to do the max energy efficiency credit. So we want to get the max energy efficiency credits out of this particular HVAC system, allowing flexibility for other things as well. And that's kind of why we want to do this this way. 
Um, and, be, and because it then frees up so much more in terms of um, systems that we can build and put into these places for the builders and, and kind of know up front that we're going to do it. Um, because that's part of the problem is, is finding out sort of, you know, right before you're trying to get somebody in is gets a little difficult. Thanks, Carolyn. I, I want to just add one more piece of stuff from the energy code tag that if you look at the last bullet on this um, list in the proposed energy code that the tag approved um, an 11 HSPF, one of the options is for either an 11 HSPF heat pump or a cold climate 10 HSPF heat pump. And those were found by the tag to be equivalent or at least to be part of the same credit table uh, or part of the same credit entry. So you get the same number of credits as an 11 HSPF as you do for a 10 with a cold climate that's uh, cold climate compatible. And that was based on some some discussion. So I just I wanted to point out that the tag for 2021 has already approved this last bullet as an equivalent to the 11. And okay. and and I appreciate that. And where we're we are right now is well, while it's a great bullet right now. There's only a couple of manufacturers. More will be coming online. And right now we look at the other options as a way to bring in more supply until the end of the 2018 code. Thanks, uh, Jay. Appreciate the work of uh, Carolyn and the proponents to take a second look at this and, and get to uh, at least the intent of the standard where we're, we think we're close to the 1.5 credits, given what's being included in this revised proposal. Um, to Chell's point, what kind of technical review has happened on this? Has have there been tag members that have looked on this? Uh, you, you mentioned the one person from NEA that had looked at it. Has there been other independent technical review? As far as I know, no. It's been a lot of just sort of trying to get where we think as, as the experts, my HVAC experts, and then Dan, and looking at how do we best get to that extra half a credit that would be needed. Um, but with the time frames, it's really hard to go out and do that. Yeah, okay. Um, and then to Carolyn's question about emergency rule, I would note that the State Building Code Council um, has already made an emergency rule in this area. This is kind of the second one to it. So if we're talking about getting over the hurdle of uh, public safety and general welfare, um, I, I would argue for better or worse, the State Building Code Council has already done that. Um, and whether we wanna revise it, um, given what I'm, I'm seeing today, I'm, I would be comfortable with recommending this go forward to for consideration by the full council. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Patrick. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Patrick Hayes, tag member, and I own an energy consulting firm that has been in existence for 30 years. And that's all I do for a living. Um, this is actually pretty good. I'm not going to delve into shell whether it qualifies as an emergency ruling or not, but I live and eat and breathe this stuff all day long. For the first bullet point, that's a pretty good option. A lot of UA calculations land right around there. And the way it's structured now, it's either 5%, 15%, or 30%. You're never gonna to get to 30%. That's like a passive house, I mean. Um, but I do see a lot right around 22, 23%. So that's useful. Second bullet point item, more people would adopt to use the energy package if it didn't have a ductless dryer. They virtually hate ductless dryers. We're trying to use them on low-rise multifamily projects, but a lot of those projects have young families and have a lot of laundry, and the ductless dryers do not fit in. We've gone to the point where 
One of my clients has actually bought three different brands and they are testing them in one of their warehouses to see if they're worthy to be used on a 140 unit apartment building. Um, the tier three, tier four, that could be used. That is useful. We've got new product. The gas tankless water heaters, I'm not seeing a lot of those used at all. And Shell already spoke to the last bullet item. Thank you, Patrick. Todd. Okay, thank you. Um, so, again, not speaking to the technical merits of this, I, 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 I trust that um, you know this, this is a thoughtful list and, and, and um, again, appreciate these contributions. In the BFP standing committee earlier this morning, uh, we had a consideration under the plumbing code that was um, technical on one side, but but the motivation to consider it was more from the local jurisdictions, you know, I, you know um, ability to have a list of solutions that either need to be formalized within the actual code uh, as this is pro is proposing or included as an appendix for consideration at the local level. Um, and we we didn't come to resolution, but moved it forward to the full council for consideration as um, an appendix so that local jurisdictions could best um, and have some guidance when they went to alternative means and methods. And I know that's not, you know, the term alternative means and methods is not being proposed here or even applies to, you know, the energy code. But my, my, my question again is, I understand that these might might be good considerations for the 2021 code and should go through the thoughtful process of and, and maybe that is emergency rule first into permanent into into 2021. But I, I still don't see how this addresses then buildings that are already permitted. How is a local jurisdiction going to interpret this essentially preemption, you know, quick preemption by the state building code council on their code? I think that's a good point, Todd. Um, from the discussion of the full council um, last time, it appeared that if we approved this, it would only apply to new permits that occur under the time period where this occurs. So if someone had a challenge because they're halfway done with a house and they can't, um, can't get the number of credits because of the equipment supply chain issues, then this would not apply to them. So I think the, so I guess I, I'm, I'm stuck in the same place you are, Todd, where I don't know how this applies retroactively to permits that are already secured um, unless somebody reapplies for a permit. Um, and I guess that's, that's, that's kind of, a concern of mine, and I don't know the answer on that one. Go ahead, Henry. Hi there, Henry Odom, a member of the Energy Tag and uh, one of the developers of R406 table. I just want to speak to the appliance credits specifically. Um, as noted, this difference in credits between the nine and a half to 11 is a half a credit. And um, parsing out an already half credit uh, option as the appliance one to make up for it doesn't quite work out uh, conceptually. And furthermore, that credit is pretty much the lion's share of that is the unvented dryer. So taking that out would uh, kind of gut the savings from there. Um, so just a quick comment on number two there. Thanks. I appreciate that, Henry. Uh, Larry. The, the going from that 11 to that 10 does give uh, an HVAC person a lot more options of available equipment, which is huge right now. So you go in, you put the air handler in that's got the variable speed drive, and that air handler will work with all this equipment, okay? But it's the outdoor unit that gives you the HSPF because you've already got the air handler, the best air handler that you can. Okay, so 
for these people that are stuck in that situation, um, this would give them some relief that at least they can close out this house. And, and I, I, I don't understand why you couldn't uh, allow people that already permitted uh, to retrofit back into this uh, situation because um, uh, right now, maybe next year, in another year, I might be able to get something to 11 without going to ductless split, but I mean a ducted system. Um, I'm not, we're not finding it. And so um, this would give you, uh, g give an opportunity for people to have it. I, I think it's a great idea to get us out of a pinch here for a short term because, uh, you know, the Biden administration took, is devoting all the chips to the transportation industry right now. And so we're second hand, we're second fiddle. And, um, and, and they must need them or he wouldn't provide them for them. And so this would kind of give us a little gap to help us through this. And I, I think it's important for the builders and the people that are buying this equipment. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Damon. Thank you. Um, it's not unusual to have to change your direction midstream building homes um, quite often. We'll run into, into an issue where I have to go back to structural engineering and submit a change to the building department. So if this did go through, uh, people that are currently building that suddenly find they can't get their equipment could go back and say, hey, I'm going to use this option instead. I, I had a recent project, I think I shared it at the last council meeting, where uh, we waited four months for the outdoor unit. Um, and we, we, it was just a moving target. It should be here in two weeks. So it's another two weeks. So it looks like another three weeks. Oh, it's on a manifest on a ship. I mean, we just can't get the product. And uh, so we're really, we're really feeling this and this would, would help out tremendously. Thanks, Damon. Uh, Darren. So sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Darren Homechick. I'm the, the senior plans examiner at City of Bothell. This, I'm just here on my own and for a building official. But we, we actually have a mechanism for um, um, using uh, even a future code like the 2021 code. It's called an alternate method request. So if an applicant wants to use a future code uh, provision um, to a current application, they can do that. They can submit an alternate method request to do that. And currently I'm working on a project for UW Bothell that's doing exactly that out of the 2021 code to the 2018 code. So I don't see any issue with doing that if they follow that, uh, that protocol. Thanks, Dan. That's good information. Um, just, I guess, the residential energy code is not yet final. In fact, it's a long way from being final. Um, so uh, the, there's many steps. There's the step today, the council on Friday, uh, this Friday, and then it will go out for a couple months for public comment. And then it will come back to the council for hearings, public hearings, and then the council will deliberate and, and finalize the code. This, the code is not likely to be finalized before November. Um, so I guess the remedy between now and November might be kind of the, the, the question. Okay, Patrick. <clears throat> uh, to chime in with Amy and, and Darren, I pull an average of 55 building permits per year. And we do permit revisions all the time, Shell, that in every municipality I've worked with, including Denver, Colorado, they all have a process for doing a permit revision. So if this did take place, and like Damien said, equipment, whatever reason, there's a method that you could go in and revise your permit. Thanks, Patrick. Corey. Hi, Shell. Um, I had a question on the process. Um, being new to the council, one in the discussion from the Energy Code, um, we want to use the Appendix L for the um, Energy Code, but in the UPC or state code, Appendix L isn't adopted. And there's also a number of other proposals that deal with plumbing. So, well, if we move forward to the council and move forward to the hearings. 
is it possible that those uh, proposals could come before the tag committee for plumbing to review and get some input that might be helpful or useful in the actual rulemaking process in the discussion when we get to that point? I guess I'm asking, how do I get Appendix L adopted if, if it's being referenced by, um, particularly it's a proposal number 46. And remember we moved it, moved it forward with the addition of you know, uh, a note from the energy code to review that um, appendix. And I was wondering if you could just help me understand how that process works. Yeah, I think that's, that's not directly related to what we're considering right now, um, but uh, when we consider the energy code in a couple hours or maybe, maybe sooner than that, um, we can consider that. You just as to be helpful, 046 is what you said? Yeah, I'm sorry. I I just heard your comment about the the when we get to public hearing. So I'm just sort of uh, I, I'm out of line if I'm interrupting the other part. So I apologize. Yeah. So that just so you, just so you know, because it, it was a question in the tag. Um, o forty six was updated to reference the uniform plumbing code. So yeah, well, but the the appendix isn't adopted by the state. So I need to get that appendix adopted if we're gonna reference it, right? Oh, you're, okay. So it says table L502.7 of the Uniform Plumbing Code, but you're saying we don't have table L adopted. Correct. And so okay. anyway, I'm, I'm out of sorts. I was just more in your discussion. Can it happen later? Uh, and if I'm, I can wait, it's okay. You guys continue. Okay, okay yeah. Um, when we, I guess that would be under other business, um, but that's certainly a good, Good question and a question for the MBE we can entertain later. Okay. Uh, Caroline, go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Shell. Um, so I guess based on Henry's comment, I might suggest that we remove bullet two if by doing that, it kind of eliminates the comparable energy savings for that option. Um, as a potential suggestion. And then also I'm gonna assume in bullet four that that is intended to be a UEF of 0.95 instead of 0 0.095. Is that accurate? That could, that could be, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that okay. And then I, I guess on that, on that one as well, just curious. Um, I think there's already a credit for a UEF of 0.91. And so just from an energy saving perspective, if going from um, the 0.91 to 0.95 is, um, yeah, getting us where we want to go or, or comparable for that one. So just a couple questions there. And then I guess the other potential um, topic I've heard raised that I don't know if it would need to get wrapped into this or not, um, or maybe it can just be an opinion or a, a correlation completely unrelated, but it semi-relates, so I'll bring it up, which is the transition from HSPF to HSPF2 and um, how that may or may not get integrated into some thinking here. Um, so there's others more expert than me on what that transition might look like in that new metric. Um, so anyway, just food for thought on that final note. Can I just address take, removing the second bullet? We, are, we were really with these bullets trying to maximize the amount of supply available. Um, and I appreciate Henry's comments, but, but we think that this does get us there or close and we wanna maximize the number of manufacturers we can pull from at this point. Okay. Um, go ahead, Todd. Okay, thank you. So um, again, I I'm I think I'm a I'm, I'm in favor of, of these approaches of these in, in moving these into more you know long term consideration, especially in the 2021 code. But I, I I don't feel that we should underwrite what was done in the previous you know the previous um, process in the 2020, 2018. Uh, because of supply chain considerations, but I would like to find what that pathway is in at the local level for this alternative methods. And I appreciate Darren and Patrick adding, you know, I'd like to hear more of that at 
<clears throat> is there another way where this is somehow incorporated as an appendix so that local jurisdictions have some consistency in it and how they may apply an alternative method for, for buildings that are already permitted? Or is that simply not effective at all um, and it throws too much to the local jurisdiction? But that's, uh, I'd like to hear more if, if anyone has feedback on that. Hey, Todd, this is Patrick. I just want to chime in real quick that the energy code is a statute, RCW 1927A, and the state has preemptions. So local jurisdictions on the group R side can't just do what they want. Exactly. And that's where I'm trying to go with this to make sure that we're, if you put the weight of the council and the state behind this, that is absolutely the best pathway. And I think you're answering that question. Is that correct? Our question was for Patrick. Well, or, or any in general. I just want to make sure that this is different than our other codes where we need to address this at the state level and yes, the jurisdictions to have this, this pathway. Yes, Todd, the energy code is different than all the other administrative codes because it's the statute has a pecking order. And so local jurisdictions in on group R, they're basically whatever you guys say, the State Building Code Council is what they have to do. I guess the only other remedy I can think of, Todd, to just, just to be comprehensive would be if the Building Code Council offered an opinion in response to a jurisdiction that asked, if there were equivalent measures, should a builder run into this issue? I guess that would be maybe not saying that that's the best option, but just saying in the spirit of being comprehensive about what the council can do, that's another way that would probably address the, the, the issue that we all agree is a real issue in a, in a different way. Probably have different pros and different cons. Okay, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, second the question about HSPF2. Uh, I'm Matt with uh, Johnstone. I'm on the distribution equipment side, but we're making decisions now on, on what to get on order and what to flow in and and knowing what's happening in Washington. And, and we're also addressing what the HSPF2 requirements are going to be, <laughs> I guess, on the DOE side and some other things, uh, knowing how it'll affect um I, I think it should be addressed if they're if you're looking for a six-term fix uh that's going to flow all the way through july of next year but we're looking at meeting these requirements on january 1 of 2023 yeah and i guess there was so there was a letter i believe from from train on that issue and i don't know that that's directly on the agenda uh, but it's in a meeting uh documents for today um i guess from you and from other people who are aware of this issue uh, at a technical level is there any easy or quick or logical resolution that no I, no and it, unfortunately it's there's not because part of it too is is figuring out what manufacturers are going to do when they because basically the hspf2 is going to slightly lower what the, the listed efficiency is and so um some of it's not even released yet um from the manufacturers um and then we also have to weigh that to what the codes are going to say and then we also you yep. know and then also the rebates too um that are okay do, so i guess to so this remedy that we see on the screen that we're considering would have the same issues with hspf as the code in general so I guess just to keep us moving on this one and, and attract resolution to this, how about we delay the HSPF discussion until we take up the energy code um, later in the agenda? Because uh, it will apply both to the new energy code, the old energy code, and to this remedy equally. And if we fix it for one, we'll probably fix it for all of them. Does that make sense? That was to me, yeah, that totally makes sense. Okay. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Matt. Uh, Damon. I think there's, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, strongly like to keep in option number two. We need flexibility. We know that, that uh, hitting that high CEF does equate to about half a credit. And so I would uh, urge us not to strike that particular option out. Thank you. Thanks, Damon. Harshad. Hi, uh, my name is Harshad Inamdar. I'm a research engineer for Reem Manufacturing. We are a manufacturer of air conditioners and heat pumps. And I know you said that you talk about the HSPF to HSPF2 conversion later, but I just wanted to say that HSPF2, the number will be lower according to DOE's new minimum efficiency standards, but the efficiency will actually be higher. The number is lower because the zero load temperature changes, the building load line changes, the test procedure is now at a higher external static pressure. So there's changes in the test procedure and in the calculation procedure for HSPF2, which makes the number look smaller, but the efficiency is actually going up. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and I hope I hope we consider that um, somewhat shortly um, when we get to the, the energy code, because that will be something that we can, need to consider. Okay, Patrick. I just want to back Damien that I don't think we should strike the second item. Um, trying to get all these credits on all these projects and passing over the appliance path because of the ductless dryer, I think is hurting us in uh, the goal to save more energy shell that we should keep that in there. It'll add to the energy savings and to the permitting process. Thanks, Patrick. Caroline. Yeah, so maybe then it's just striking the not require the dryer. What I thought I, I heard Damon just say was um, that, I mean, I don't know if this suggestion here is intended to be code language, but um, it seems like there's a, an, another option there to have the CEF of 3.93 or higher. But I, I guess what I heard Henry say was that if we just eliminate the dryer from the appliance package entirely as part of the requirement, then there, there may not be a way to get the, the half credit. But uh, the second option there is maybe a viable one to keep on the table. So you would strike from the comma to the word change? Yes. I guess it would be permit. Maybe, oh, from but. You'd, you'd strike from the word but to the word change is if it wanted to read properly. So whoever's doing, I don't know who has the screen controls. So after start at not and go all the way to change. Yeah, and this is just to be clear, we're not writing code language at this point. We are telling staff to write code language that meets the intent of what's on the screen. Right. And energy star should be no T at the end. Oh, probably. That's a typo. Um, and that's more of a more of an intent. So um, in the 2021 draft code, which the tag approved, it requires the dryer to be a 2022 energy star most efficient list is the reference in the adopted proposed language. Um, and I would like, just from a clarity and consistency standpoint, if we could keep it consistent to the extent possible with the 2021 language or other language, then normally if this was code language, we would go through the tag and we would have lots of robust discussion on it. And here we're having abbreviated discussion. so to the extent that we can keep it to what the tag has already suggested. I, I see that you know the, the, the fifth bullet is, is clear to me that the tag approved something like this with the 2021 code. For the first one, it is a reasonable interpretation interpolation between a credit that's already in the 2018 code that's one credit and a, a credit that's worth two credits. And this is meeting it exactly halfway in between. So it seems a reasonable interpolation. interpolation um, 
for the bullets two, three, and four, these are kind of brand new ideas. And I'm, I'm, I'm less comfortable with brand new ideas uh, with less vetting um, than ideas that, that have already passed a tag either in the 2018 or the, the 2021 code. So I think we need to be very careful as we attempt to, to look at bullets two, three, and four and, and approve them because basically what we're doing when we do this is the least energy efficient option is the one that we would, is the one that we would need, you know, when we do the credit table, we make sure every option meets a minimum energy savings. And, with, and the, the least energy efficient one is the one that we need to kind of consider, uh, especially if it's a lowest cost one, would be selected. And so that wouldn't deliver the energy savings that the legislators mand us, mandated us to do. So if one of these is least cost and not quite meeting our energy thresholds, then um, then, then we need to be really concerned about uh, rolling back the, the energy code. So that's why I'm less, less comfortable with new kinds of language here. Um, and if, if, you know, if for the fourth bullet, going from uh, 0.91 to 0.95, I'm not entirely sure. It doesn't, it wouldn't appear to be a, a 600 kWh savings on an annual basis. And I'd love to see any documentation that it is uh, that um, I don't know tier three or tier four have heap up water heaters. And I'd love to see some analysis that suggests that that's 600 kWh or, or half a credit. And then um, for the dryer, I guess, from a language perspective, I'd love to see it either reflect the 2021 language, which is the 2022 Energy Star Most Efficient List, or, or have some comfort that the CEF of 3.93 is equivalent to the 2022 or perhaps 2021 Energy Star Most Efficient List. Just, just so that we're, we're being consistent with, with codes in the past and, and, and the, the next code cycle that we're doing. It's my editorial comments on this. Um, go ahead, Todd. So what's the proposed action here? I mean, one would be that we would move it straight to recommendation to the, the whole council on Friday, but isn't there another where it moves back down to the TAG, even though the TAG's been extremely taxed recently with the 2021 changes, right? I think if we move it to the TAG, the TAG will not be able to convene before Friday. So we would then be delaying this remedy for at least a month until the next code meeting, uh, council meeting. And I don't know, the, I don't even remember where the next council meeting is. It might be several months away. So I guess the, while moving it to the TAG is an option that might delay it for several months. But that's my concern also that I, 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 can, I can get behind the technical support of the technical merit of this. I've expressed my concerns on, on process and emergency rule process, and, but that, that question would be to the MVP of, MVP, sorry, of, of whether or not that certain things need more tag. Are there bullet items in here that are comfortable moving forward and there are others that could move forward with consideration for more stakeholders at the take level. I guess is Caroline. Caroline, you said uh, Dan did the analysis on this. Yeah, Dan was the one who did the analysis on this. And, and is Dan and available? I don't know. He wasn't available today. He said he could be there on Friday. I think. Um, and he was going to send some notes in, I think, to see if to say that he did support this, and he feels that these these bullets do meet um, the required half credit amount, you know, to meet the half credit. And so that, and and I just want to remind everyone, we're looking for something. We need a solution it's pretty soon because um, we have people, we have houses that are having problems. So, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, just one clarifying question. I'm assuming that these are all, this would be an or statement such that we're not removing the opportunity for those who um, plan ahead and order their product and, exactly. you know, zero to four months, they can get 11 HSPF yeah. high efficiency heat pump for those yep. that, that do that. That's still a choice. This is an option merely to provide 
more options for everyone out there trying to get people into heat pump systems. Okay, and we're, sorry. I guess I was gonna say, we don't need to do anything with this today. Um, if, I guess my understanding, and Krista, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that this would go on the council agenda for Friday, whether we do something or not. So we're, if we wanna make these recommendations that you see in red on the screen, we could make a motion to forward to the council with these recommendations, or we could not do anything. And then this language would just show up at the council on Friday. So. Yeah, I guess child away in there. I mean, I think I agree with your sentiment that option first and fifth bullet have been vetted by the tag from an energy savings perspective. And those would be ones that if the full council feels that the best pathway at this moment is an emergency rule, that 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 would be something it, it does seem like the other three need, um, yeah, some backup documentation to ensure that those are providing the same energy savings. Yeah, so I guess if we wanted to, we could make a motion saying we we would, we are forwarding this to the council. We think options one and five are, you know, vetted. Um, we have more concerns about two, three, and four and would like more documentation on those. I guess that's that would be a motion that could be made. Um, or or someone could could suggest something else. We do need to move on um, at some point. So I guess if, if nobody wants to make a motion, we will take this up to the council. Katie, I saw your hand, uh, your, your actual hand up. Go ahead. My actual hand. Um, so does that, sorry, so that would mean that we would not include that language about the two, three, and four, and it would be discussed on Friday. And yeah, we would take a the, take this uh, this letter up anew on Friday, and we could certainly make the same comments on it, um, or we could forward the language we have in front of us with concerns about two, three, and four, and, and recommend it. Um, Rec recommendations that we want more information on those things. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, um, let's move on to the next item. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, Carolyn. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you on Friday. Thank you. Okay, we are on to the next agenda item, which is the IMC IFGC. And um, uh, Caroline, do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, thanks, Jill. So we had um, 17 proposals for the mechanical code, the fuel gas code, and the mechanical chapters of the residential code. Um, one proposal, proposal 20 was an editorial item considered by staff. So we considered the remaining 16 proposals over four tag meetings, um, in some cases discussing proposals multiple times. Of the 16 proposals, 14 were approved by the tag as modified most unanimously, but a few did have one or two nay votes or abstentions. Um, most of the proposals do not have cost impacts, but rather just clarifications, pointers, or better correlation. Um, the proposals that do have cost impacts are the filtration ones, um, so proposals 86, 98, 62, and 63. Two proposals, um, proposal 62 and 63, were disapproved. Um, so those are my general statements for the mechanical tag report. I just want to quickly run through each proposal just to give a super high-level summary. Um, and then in terms of items to consider or potentially modify today, I think there are um, just a couple. 
So um, really quick from top to bottom of what you see on the screen here, um, proposal one, it adds a row in a gas valve table in the fuel gas code to allow for the use of larger sized flanged valves. The next one, uh, proposal eight, this pertains to the residential code and then three rows down is proposal nine, um, which is the same topic for the IMC. Um, so this proposal permits the use of ASHRAE 62.2 as an alternate compliance path to the whole house ventilation requirements for R2. Um, the intent of this proposal was to increase ventilation rates in low rise residential, but um, I think uncertainty if this proposal will accomplish that because the proposal makes 62.2 optional, not mandatory. Um, so there's there's nothing really prohibiting designers from providing additional ventilation in our current code. So it begs the question of what benefit this change is providing. Um, there were concerns this was just creating additional work for code officials as they now have to be able to review and approve two different codes for whole house ventilation. So on this one, I'm just curious what type of public comments we get on the CR 102 as to whether this is a, a helpful addition to our code. Um, proposal 62 and 63, I'm gonna skip those were narrowly disapproved by the tag. I'll circle back to them at the end. Um, proposal 87 modifies an existing state amendment and provides some better clarity around the type of access um, required to be provided to appliances located above ceilings um, for maintenance and such. Proposal nine is the companion to proposal eight. Um, proposal 77 creates an exception for the location of intake air openings for group R occupancies located above parking lots and parking garage entries. Proposal 85 specifies if you're using an intake exhaust combination termination fitting, the exhaust air concentration within the intake airflow may not be greater than 10%. Uh, proposal 10 clarifies that for R2, ERVs are only required if the project is complying with the commercial energy code. Um, if it's resi, it's in the option table. Proposal 76 um, is cleanup and clarification to the Washington Amendment for whole house ventilation. Um, proposal 63 is the companion to 62 that we'll come back to. Um, proposal 19 is about um, mechanical exhaust and where you can discharge that exhaust based on what type of exhaust it is. So we have an existing state amendment that has the same requirements for parking garage exhaust and transformer vault exhaust um, in terms of the permissible distances that exhaust can be from property lines, operable openings into buildings and finished sidewalk. So this proposal creates a new exception just for transformer vault exhaust separate from the parking garage exhaust to enable slightly different requirements. Proposal 20 is just editorial. Um, proposal 86 applies to air handlers and ERVs providing more than 500 CFM and requires that those include a filter box that is capable of housing a MERV-13 filter. So in the case of a wildfire smoke event, that additional filtration can be provided. That said, this proposal um, is removed if the next proposal, Proposal 98, is ultimately adopted. So Proposal 98 is a substantive proposal. Um, it increases the filtration requirement for ducted air handlers and ventilation systems from anywhere from a MERV 6 to 8, kind of depending on what it is in our current code, to a MERV 8 or 13. Um, and those filtration requirements are based on occupancy type. Um, there's some important exceptions in that. I think we did get some comments on that. So we will circle back to this one. Uh, proposal uh, 75 relates to fire barriers and fire partitions and duct penetrations. So in the current code, ducts that penetrate fire barriers or fire partitions require fire dampers unless one of three exceptions is met. Uh, so one of those exceptions relates to having a fully ducted system in a sprinkler building as long as that system is constructed of sheet steel. In the 2021 model code, the sheet steel requirement for fire barriers was updated to allow non-metallic flexible air connections in certain situations. So this proposal um, takes that same modification for fire barriers from the model code and applies it to fire partitions. Proposal 74 clarifies um, generator requirements by pointing to other relevant codes. Um, and then lastly, Proposal 78 um, pertains to fuel oil systems and clarifies how far away the vent piping must be from building openings and outdoor air intakes. 
So that is the quick uh, tour of the mechanical code proposals. I think I just want to circle back to 62 and 63 that were disapproved and talk about those for a moment. Um, so these proposals sought to increase ventilation over residential style range hoods. So the simplified um, summary of these is that in our current code, it requires either 100 CFM of intermittent exhaust or 30 CFM of continuous exhaust over a range hood. Um, this proposal in its final form would have required 160 CFM over an electric range and 250 CFM over a combustion range for intermittent exhaust, and it would have resulted in increased continuous ventilation for enclosed kitchens. Um, at the TAG, we were extremely fortunate to have industry experts contribute to the discussion on this proposal. Uh, we learned that while both electric and combustion ranges produce particulate pollution, uh, combustion ranges also produce NO2, carbon monoxide, and aldehydes, and there's research connecting those contaminants to negative children's health outcomes. We learned NO2 travels throughout a home impacting all occupants and that this problem is more acute in smaller apartments and homes that have less indoor volume and therefore higher concentrations of pollutants and that these building types are more typical of lower income um, residents. So, you know, said differently, this topic was brought forward as an important opportunity to improve indoor air quality. And I think all sides of the conversation um, genuinely were pro ventilation as one expert put it, um, and are recognizing that codes will be moving this direction. Um, so three kind of themes of the conversation that was had at the tag level uh, first, timing. So a similar version of this proposal has been adopted in California's um, Title 24, and work is underway to integrate this research into ASHRAE 62.2, but the 62.2 work is not yet finalized, and there were concerns that Washington's proposal may not align with the final CFM or capture efficiency um, for ASHRAE 62.2. I think the second kind of theme topic was um, just complexity. The original proposal had multiple rows where the CFM requirement changed based on home size with a higher CFM for smaller homes. And a working group revised the proposal to simplify it to only one row to help streamline the change for manufacturers and to ensure product availability and smaller cost impacts um, at those CFMs and sound ratings. So this approach also simplifies the proposal for code officials, but it still provides um, reasonable protective ventilation for smaller apartments and homes. And then the third kind of topic of discussion was around makeup air. Um, so our current code only requires makeup air if you're exhausting more than 400 CFM. So this proposal does not trigger that, um, but there was a lot of conversation specific to apartments or multifamily about makeup air. So anyway, that was just some general background on that one for the committee in case we get any comments on that. Um, so I was gonna propose that we address the posted comments on proposal 98, the filtration proposal, um, but I see a couple of hands up. Um, so maybe we will pivot to those. And I think Chell, the ultimate goal here, right, for the mechanical code and the, the RESI energy code is to, um, for this committee to consider any modifications in public comment today and then move those forward to the full council on Friday. Is that your intent? That's my understanding. And I guess, yes, my understanding is we would want a motion at some point today to approve some package of mechanical and IFGC proposals to the council and same with the Washington State Energy Code Residential. So, and this group has the purview to um, not forward uh, proposals that the TAG approved or forward proposals that the TAG did not approve. Um, and the council similarly on Friday has the opportunity to um, not include proposals that the tag approved or the MBE approved or resuscitate proposals that were not approved by the MBE committee or the tag. So we have some latitude to, to, to do that. Um, we have the latitude to do that today. So I guess Caroline, that's your, 
that's your report and now we'll take public comment on it or do you or should we maybe take public comment about 98 first or or one of the proposals first or should we just open it up um, Miss, why don't we, go ahead why don't we open it up if somebody lands on a certain proposal we'll discuss that and then we'll move on to the another proposal does that sound like a good all right, Johnny. Hey, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I worked with uh, Mark Bossler here, who was very kind to show up and, and dedicate a lot of time to, to proposal 62 and 63, which were disapproved, um, disappointingly, during the mechanical ventilation tag. Um, you know, I I worked with, with, with many folks on the proposed language, um, specifically want to thank Mike Moore and Eric Vandermeer, who very gave a lot of time to help write the code and, and ensure that it was both enforceable and fair. Also listened to um, a request from HVI and manufacturers who asked to simplify tables and, and lower limits of ventilation to make more products available. And um, was very disappointed when the um, mechanical ventilation tag um, voted three to two against these proposals. Um, specifically, I reached out to two of those members. I, I think um, one of the members of, that voted against it uh, had voiced uh, their concerns during the meeting, which was primarily cost based. Um, the other two members I reached out to and never received any information on why, why they were uh, they voted against them in the end, so I'm a little unclear on what specific issues they had because I was more than willing to, you know, make reasonable concessions or um, changes to help address their concerns. But I'm I'm hoping that the MVE committee will um, reconsider these proposals um, and um, and forward them forward to the State Building Codes Council and uh, allow Mark to say anything else that I may have missed on this. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, Mark. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would strongly advocate for reconsidering um, these two uh, hood range ventilation proposals. Um, gas cooking clearly increases the risk of, or the concentrations of air pollutants above and beyond uh, cooking itself, uh, particularly nitrogen dioxide, which is a uh, potent stimulator of asthma. Kids that live in homes with gas stoves have a 40% increased risk of asthma symptoms compared to kids in homes with electric stoves. Um, this is not a fringe position. The Washington State Medical Association uh, last fall called for policies to reduce the risks of gas cooking in homes. Uh, the Washington Academy of Family Physicians uh, this spring had a similar uh, resolution. And just today, the American Medical Association representing physicians across the entire country uh, uh, specifically resolved not, uh, uh, supporting policies to reduce the use of gas for cooking and to increase ventilation rates in homes with gas stoves, specifically calling for this. These are your, your nation's doctors, your state's doctors. We want you to do something about it. I'm really disappointed that this could just die here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, Mark. Eric. Good afternoon. Eric Vandermeer representing uh, myself today. Um, again, I was, I did participate in the, the tag process and worked extensively. I would like to talk briefly about yeah, proposals 63 and 62. Again, I think uh, the tag is a pretty um, limited audience that got to review that that content. Uh, there was extensive work done to to make enforceable code, and it would be my recommendation that that, that has moved forward into the public comment process to get a, a wider range of um, you know public comment on that. That this is a key health and um, wellness. Um, criteria 
that that needs that it that, that is you know sorely lacking uh, better and enforceable codes. So I think it is an important step forward to uh, to looking at how we we ventilate kitchens properly and you know what what are appropriate um, exhaust rates. So again, there there was extensive work done on that proposal. Um, we're not you know quite sure at this point what could be done to the proposal to to get a consensus vote out of the tag. Um, the tag essentially ran out of time to work on it further and move towards consensus as required by um, the council's bylaws. So I would definitely recommend getting that proposal into uh, the CR 102 to get further public comment and feedback on you know appropriate ventilation above both electric and uh, natural gas ranges. Um, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Nancy. Sorry, um, forgot I had to move so fast. So um, I want to, I really appreciate what Eric just said. I'm an indoor air quality specialist who's um, followed these issues for, for many years and was thrilled to see Actually, I came to speak on all on four proposals, um, but first for 62 and 63, we've known for some time that we really need to exhaust cooking fumes from, from homes, but we particularly need to exhaust gas fumes. Um, I've served on the tag off and on for, for many years, so Eric's aware of um, my concern. I appreciate his help with making this an implementable um, um, requirement. Uh, Mark's already expressed the um, health effects. This is an environmental justice issue for the Department of Health and a health and safety issue. So I too hope that this proposal for the exhaust ventilation can move forward. And to me, it is a baby step. There are other things that I hope will be done for better exhaust ventilation from cooking in homes in the future. Um, as far as the MRF 13 requirement, um, we are very, very supportive of this. If you've read the ventilation guidance around COVID from the Department of Health, which I was the primary author of, we are following the guidance from ASHRAE and from EPA, um, extensive research work coming out of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, California um, Research and others to support MRF 13 for any recirculated air in order to control respiratory viruses. And then for um, several years now, EPA, California, myself and the Department of Health has been recommending MRF 13 for filtering outside air. It's become a huge issue in areas um, with wildfire smoke, which can be for um, several months now and even longer for some parts of the country. Um, and also, if we have areas with um, high levels of traffic-related air pollution, um, pollution from um, airports, industry, um, wood burning, which is a huge issue in our state, being able to filter that outside air is really important. So we, again, um, are thrilled to see these proposals, hoping they're going through. We're a little... Um, that behind you should have um, letters from my office in your email by now. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I just wanted to make two points. The first being I was one of the tag members who voted to disapprove this um, based on the cost um, implications as well as um, the ASHRAE standards and the um, the potential that our standards that we adopt at the state level might not align with those once those come out. Um, and then the second point being that um, as one of the three um, votes that um, voted to disapprove, I actually was not reached out to. Um, so I just want to clarify that. Um, but yeah, thank you um, so much for your time today. and. Um, oh, actually, I have a third point here. Um, there's been a lot of reference to the fact that it's gas that creates the pollutants, but the science community um, 
there's disagreements on that. Some say it's the cell cleaning function and the fumes that are emitted from that, as well as it's not necessarily the fuel type of the appliance that you're cooking on. It's more so the, the food that you're cooking. So just wanted to make that point that there's a disagreement within the science community that it's not necessarily um, tied to the fuel type of the appliance. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea, Johnny. Um, yeah, there's somebody on the phone. I was just raising my hand for them. So I would like a person on the phone to be able to speak. Oh, who's on the phone? Hi, I'm Christina Soman Faulkner. I'm a physician and a co-chair at Washington Physicians for Social Responsibilities Climate and Health Task Force. And I want to say that emissions from gas stoves are contributing to a variety of health problems and even premature deaths. Children, those with pre-existing conditions, and people living in areas with greater air pollution, often low-income people and communities of color are the most vulnerable to these health consequences. Traction for this issue is growing and it will continue to grow. Just yesterday, the American Medical Association adopted a resolution to increase messaging to healthcare providers and to the public that cooking with gas stoves increases household air pollution, risk of childhood asthma, and asthma severity. The resolution includes a directive acknowledging that health consequences can be mitigated by increasing ventilation and filtration while decreasing use of gas stoves. Air pollution from gas stoves is being likened to secondhand smoke. This issue is impacting people's lives and livelihoods and needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Larry, you're up next. I got two comments. Are, on the MERV 13, are we talking about residential equipment here or, or are we talking about commercial equipment? Shell, is that is that yeah, residential? It, uh, Larry, it would apply to R2 permitted under the IMC. It's an IMC proposal, not an IRC proposal. So, so we're talking uh, duplex and beggar or R2, four more stories. Four more stories. So is that, a, is that individual apartments in four or more stories or is that commercial equipment, you know, floating the air around all the businesses? No, it, it impacts um, dwelling units, apartments. It's for our occupancies is one of the key places given how much time people. Okay, so. So it could be an individual furnace in an individual apartment in a four-story apartment, right? It's anything under the mechanical code is what it could be. So. Okay. What my concern with is, is, is the pressure drop that you have with an, a MERV 13 filter. It's exceeding um, of what a MERV 6 is. And so, um, that's that's what we're finding out is they they buy these super tight filters and the residential equipment isn't designed to push against that. And so then we start taking out compressors, which we've replaced a lot of them because of that. But and then my second thought is um, is on the gas part of it. Now, my folks have had two gas ranges since uh, probably early 70s. My whole, my, my brother and I and my mom, and my dad, we all grew up in there and uh, we have hoods over both of them. And uh, my dad's 91. Uh, he's lived in that house since the sixties. And, um, and I've periodically taken my back rack 400 machine over there to test it. And, uh, and when, when the equipment is clean, and operating correctly, uh, I don't see these uh, these problems that you guys are talking about. And in fact, EPA, the government, says there is no problem with the gas range. It's it's stated right that. But if it isn't adjusted properly, and you got food slopped over the side, and then the flame comes on, then we have all kinds of combustibles happening. Okay, 
And so we need to service our gas equipment yearly and it needs to be checked properly. And, uh, and, and when I've done that, because my, my, my dad, I care a lot about, he's 91 years old. I don't want him to gas himself out. Um, I haven't seen the problems that that's talked. And I've read the studies that RMI has done. And, um, and I really question, because I have the same equipment that they have, and I have not found it to happen with properly adjusted equipment. And but if the equipment is not clean and uh, not set up properly, yeah, you can have those kind of problems. And uh, but properly adjusted equipment, I haven't seen that to be a problem. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Go ahead, uh, Scott. Uh, hey, my name is Scott Peterson with the Northwest Gas Association. Um, I'm concerned about these hyperbolic statements about indoor air quality because they're counterproductive to getting a good, good policy, like comparing it to a gas stove to secondhand smoke. The use of science does not guess at causes of health effects, specifically and as related to asthma, the association between the presence of a natural gas cooking appliance and increases in asthma in children is not supported by data-driven investigations covering actual appliance usage, emissions rates, exposures, and the control of other factors that are well-established for contributing to asthma and other respiratory system threats. I might add, just because a scientist says something, and we've learned this the hard way recently, just because a scientist says something doesn't make it science, or just because a doctor says something doesn't make it truly medical science. I might point to the study, uh, Cooking Fuels and Prevalence of Asthma, uh, uh, a global analysis of phase three of the International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood, which analyzed 512,707 primary and secondary school children from 108 centers in 47 countries. And the money quote is, no evidence of an association between the use of gas as a cooking fuel and either asthma symptoms or asthma diagnosis, unquote. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Scott. Nancy, you're up. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I'm feeling a little discouraged. I'm not sure this is the place to get into um, an argument over who's picking cherry picking research. If the council's interested, I can help provide um, peer reviewed studies from nationally recognized groups, including EPA, on the health effects from. Um, gas stoves and why we want um, exhaust fans used. And yes, there is a difference between gas and electric. Obviously, it's, it's the additive of the gas versus there's always going to be particulates from cooking. So it doesn't sound like this might be the right place to get into this, but there is plenty of evidence coming out of reliable um, researchers. And the MERV 13 filters, again, there's a great deal of research coming out on um, the benefits to health. And um, this would be for new construction. So it's not like we're talking about putting a MERV 13 on an existing um, furnace, even though there are studies out of the University of California Davis and others showing the pressure drop in general is not um, a significant problem, but if you carefully read the ventilation guidance from the Department of Health and EPA, you will say we do say you have to, um, for existing systems, do a proper evaluation. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we've had lots of discussion on this. I'd like to hear uh, new voices and new information. So go ahead, uh, Peter. Yeah, I, I'd just like to invite both Nancy and Scott to send me their studies and I will look over them in great detail. Uh, I spent uh, many years reviewing 
scientific papers. And uh, I don't really want to see that this kind of anecdotal uh, back and forth about quotes from random papers. That doesn't suit me as a scientist of many years. So please send me those uh, those papers and references that I can get to without you know spending a lot of money on it. Thank you. If you can send me the PDFs directly, that would be great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Jay. As we look at the um, you know complexity and the, the information we've had within the 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 you know half hour that we've discussed uh, on this, I, I think it points to the fact that we should have a further broader discussion. And I'd like to to um, say we need to take this out to public hearing and get this input and have a chance to consider it. We've heard about the complexity and the cost of the proposal. Maybe that would also give us a chance for more refinement if appropriate, but clearly an important issue and one that I, I think we do a disservice um, if uh, we follow the, in the, um, the committee recommendation and stop the discussion at this point. I think we need um, more input and need to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Greg. Thanks, Jill. I was just going to say, I've sat through about four or five conferences where Lawrence Berkeley Labs has presented all this information. The studies are very public out there. Range hood capture for cooking, in particular gas cooking, makes a huge difference. And Lawrence Berkeley Labs is kind of the source of all that information. Thanks, Greg. OK, and I guess we are at the end of the time we spend on this this particular code going to make a motion to move lots of things to the council um we could if if desired we could make individual motions to put this into the package that we're eventually going to approve and send to the council or we could wait till the end and then make a larger motion once we've heard on all of the issues so um I think we're, we've heard lots on this issue. Um, I want to hear from everybody, but I, but this is not the technical advisory group and we don't have hours to spend on, on a single issue like this. So um, if uh, MVE committee members are, are want to see this brought to the CR102 process or at least to the council on Friday, they can make a motion to re-include this in the package. Um, now or or later um go ahead uh uh um eric yeah, i guess i'd like to make one follow-up comment on uh the the range should exhaust um to me this isn't a natural gas versus electric uh there was a lot of other um you know work done on this section it could be a good concession for this code cycle to to have the same airflow rate for natural gas versus electric and still make a huge step forward. So I think, um, again, I urge the, count, the, com the committee to move this, you know, to further public comments so we can, you know, find out, find better code language for this. Um, I'd also, if we're, if we're closing comments on the, uh, on the mechanical code provisions, uh, I did submit uh, written testimony on the, the MERV 13098 proposal. I do have some very specific recommendations that I would recommend incorporating before this goes out to uh, a CR 102, um, just so we can make this enforceable code language. This proposal went through several iterations in the tag process. And again, we kind of were doing some pretty um, major uh, changes in the last meeting to uh, to incorporate the comment working through technical language. So um, both uh, Mike Fowler, the proponent, and myself have done a re-review of this since the tag meeting and have some uh, specific exceptions that we're recommending to uh, to clarify the code and to uh, limit impacts to certain systems. So uh, again, I would urge the MVE committee to uh move this forward um with the these uh recommendations thank you thanks eric carolyn
Carolyn, for some reason, I can't hear you. You guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, on behalf of North, both Northwest Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association and the Washington Air Conditioning Contractors Association, I think just in this discussion, listening to studies, just kind of being an outsider on this and looking at all these studies, and we've seen them all, there are studies on both sides. I would hope that staff or somebody would put together instead of just relying on one person on a group's word that this is a reliable study, that there would be a really good kind of independent evaluation staff would maybe provide information from both um, kind of all peer reviewed studies and all things on this issue because and, and also what the control factors are in terms of were they all done in the same way? How did, were they looking at homes of a certain age? Was it multifamily versus individual houses? There's so many variables that I would hope it'd be a really, if you guys are gonna make these kinds of decisions, um, which probably need to be made in a different rulemaking environment, not in code, I really would hope that there'd be a good review of all those studies, not just one or two groups worth. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, Larry. Uh, my questions to Eric here. I'm a real proponent to electronic air cleaners, and I don't see them listed here on this. And with the electronic air cleaner with the post filter in it, uh, I get nearly the benefits of a 13 MERV without the pressure drop. And, and, and I think it should be expanded so you can use electronic air cleaners in that proposal. The other thing is it's not disposable. I mean, you clean them, you throw them back in, and away you go. So you, you, you're cutting your garbage tremendously, and they do an excellent job. In fact, if you buy a smoke eater, that's what you buy is electronic air cleaner, okay? They do a great job, but they're not listed here in this proposal, and I think it needs to be added. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Eric, do you wanna respond, or Caroline? Um, yeah, electronic air cleaners can be very effective, yes, and um, I, I think the, you know, if this goes through the public comment process, we could definitely, you know, develop code language for that. I don't have it off the top of my head right now, so. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Caroline, you're up next. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion um, to uh, incorporate the comments that Eric and Mike submitted on proposal 98, the filtration proposal, to make sure that those get integrated into the version considered um, by the council on Friday. Okay, we have a motion to include the comments um, made on proposal 98 uh, by Eric and who else? Uh, Mike Fowler, I think it was. Hey, Mike Fowler, uh, into proposal 98. Um, so that's the motion. Is there a second? This is Todd, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Is there further discussion on this issue? And Carolyn, Larry, and Caroline, you have your hands still up. So please lower your hands unless you have further comment on this. This issue. Okay, Carolyn. Okay. Um, uh, Katie. Can, can you just remind us which comments those were? There were several, I'm sorry to. Yeah, so these were uh, technical comments that Eric made and, um, and Mike Fowler and um, can you bring those up, Krista? These were on a, these were on proposal uh, 090. Um, so these are the ones, yeah, they were just up on. Oh, they were already sent. I see. That's, I see. That, that's, that's enough clarification. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's vote on this motion. I don't see any more hands up. So the motion is to include 098 uh, with comments by Eric and Mike as submitted. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. We've included 098 with comments. Um, are there other comments or otherwise we could take a motion to move this package forward? Or we could make motions to include just various pieces of this as we move forward.
Katie. So it's this would not it so this whole package would be um without 62 and 63 which we spent a lot of time talking on and i would echo what jay said it seems like there needs to be more public comment on that one okay so so if you could make a motion to uh, to move the entire package forward including 062 and 063 yeah well so moved <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Did you say second, Jay? I did. Okay. So we have a motion, which is to move the entire package of IMC, IFGC code change proposals as voted on the tag forward, um, which includes the prior motion of 098 with comments from Mike and um, Eric, and to also include 062 and 063. Um, in that package, even though the tag just approved them. So that's that's the motion as I understand it. And we have a second for that motion. Is there further discussion on this, Todd? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be re redundant to what I said on the BFP this morning, and hopefully that's a good thing. Um, I'd like to go you know, way out and say, of course, the, the action on Friday by the council is to propose to move these into public process, which, which we call the CR 102. And so the action today by the committee is to make a recommendation to the council to take action on Friday right. um, based on, on the technical input from the, the stakeholder level. So I wanna make sure everyone is aware that what we're, the action we're taking here is to move it into more public process, which is mm -hmm. the CR 102. And I make that point because when a, when a committee potentially um, makes a different um, recommendation than the tag, it is to move it into more public process. And I, I think what's in my mind, to disapprove something at this level is a very high bar, very high threshold to stop something, uh, whereas to approve it to move forward for further consideration is, 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 a, is a lower threshold. So I, I support um, including those two. I think they do have merit to, for further, further um, work. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Todd. Further discussion? Okay, um, let's do a roll call vote on this one. All in favor of the motion, which I'm just going to restate. Um, uh, Chris is going to do a roll call on this one, just so we make sure we have all the words counted. Um, the motion is to move the entire package forward as voted on the tag with the two exceptions, one being 098 with additional comments supplied, and then also to include 062 and 063 in that package we forward to the council. Caroline Traub? Yes. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Bayreuther? Aye. Peter Rieke? Aye. Katie Sheehan? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. All right, motion passes unanimously. Okay, all right, we are on to the next agenda item, which is the energy code. Um, Washington State Energy Code Residential, and as the, the tag chair, I am going to um, make a brief introduction to that. I uh, wrote a brief letter um, that is on the uh, meeting website. It talks about the number of hours we spent and number of proposals and the, um, the, the kinds of proposals we, we considered. Um, so I'm going to really briefly summarize each one so that there's kind of general understanding of what how this code will be different um, than the formal code. So the first one changes the definition of residential uh, such that R2 with enclosed corridors less than three stories are now in the commercial code. And this one was actually passed 14 to one to three. So the tag generally or overwhelmingly supported it. Um, the next one was disapproved. We're not gonna talk about that. I mean, we could. Um, the next one was 11 to five to two. It lowers the window U factor prescriptively from 0.30 to 0.28. 
that was an option in R406. Now it's no longer an option because it's it's required. The next two are clerical. Um, that includes 011 and 012. Um, 090 was disapproved. It would have increased the installation installation standard, um, but that was disapproved. Uh, the next one is 088. That requires uh, certification for the agencies that train people to do uh, pressurization tests for, for single family, multifamily, and, and including R2 occupancies. The, the, the biggest change is for R2 occupancies. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's that one. The next couple are clerical. Um, that's 081, 082. Um, 064 was disapproved. 015 is mostly just a clerical, clerical one. Um, then 065 is heat pump space heating. It requires heat pumps for space heating. Um, there's a lot of discussion. It includes gas fired heat pumps and gas backup uh, as options within the proposal. Um, the next one, uh, sealed air handler requires air handlers to be in condition space. Um, the next one, 049, requires pipe insulation near equipment to be removable. So if there's repairs required, you don't rip it off. You can actually removable, remove it and reinstall it um, to maintain the integrity. Um, the next one is heat pump water heater. Uh, that requires heat pump water heaters, which includes gas um, heat pump water heaters um, uh, in the prescriptive code. The next one um, was is about efficiency in uh, water circulation systems, domestic hot water circulation systems, including uh, requiring a dedicated return pipe instead of allowing the uh, a cold water return pipe. Uh, the next one, 089, uh, reduces from five ACH to three ACH for the uh, blower door test or the pressurization test. And for R2, it goes from 0 0.40 to 0.25 CFM square foot. It also removes the eight and a half foot height uh, for calculations that was in the 2018 uh, code. The next two, 013 and 014 were uh, clerical. There was some also withdrawn ones that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, then 080, um, water heaters need to be within the thermal envelope. Um, the next one is really, it just references the IPC. This is one Corey mentioned. Um, references the, the plumbing code for water volume cal calcs. And this is only important because of a new R406 thing that we're going to talk about. And that's for 047. The next few were, were disapproved. Um, next several. Um, then 070 emissions factors. Um, that was an interesting one because the integrated draft already included the, that number for the electric emissions factor, but just to show tag intent, um, the tag approved the, the same number that was already in the integrated draft. The R406 is the next one, a major change, well, uh, uh, updates to the R406 changes, including fuel normalization and credit options. This attracted a lot of discussion, and um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more uh, today because um, we passed a lot of things that modified R406. And so um, Henry, uh, who is a proponent for the, this R406 change in 073, uh, went back and looked at all or many of the other uh, code proposals that passed the tag and um, adapted the R406 table to reflect those, um, those realities that the tag passed. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more. I, I'm not going to go into it too much, too much now. Um, the next one, performance pathway, uh, removed R406 requirements from the OR405 energy modeling pathway. Um, the next couple were disapproved. Uh, O34 is a new credit for a connected thermostat. Um, the next couple are about uh, basically giving credit for cold climate heat pumps or incentivizing or acquiring cold climate heat pumps within the options table. If you want to go for a credit, you need um, cold climate heat pumps. O24 um, was modified to reflect what the, um, what the the fifth bullet in the letter that we saw today for the emergency rule uh, that I mentioned, 
where you get credit for either an HSPF of 11 or a cold climate heat pump with an HSPF of 10. Um, O25 um, allows uh, heat pump options. Um, O50, the next one, uh, talks about the coefficient of performance and AHRI requirements for, for heat pumps. Um, the next one is the one that uh, uh, uses the plumbing code reference earlier. And if you design a water system that is compact, uh, the, there's some energy savings there. And this is as an option to the R4 is stable for that. Um, the next one is for additions. It, it changes the some some it modifies the addition section to from 100 square feet to 100 from 100 square feet to 150 square feet for certain requirements. Um, so that was it was felt that a 100 square foot 120 square foot addition might not need to meet certain requirements. So you get all the way up to 150 square feet to do things without additional requirements. Um, and then all, the next three were disapproved. So that's a a brief summary of of what the, the TAG considered. We met many times over many, many, many hours, had lots of discussions and lots of the proponents met with lots of people outside of those TAG hours and modified the proposals to make them more palatable, more feasible, more enforceable, and generally you know, really good code language in all of those. Um, so that's the, the TAG report. Um, I know we want to talk about R406 today, um, because there's there's an update based on what I mentioned earlier, um, and when we get to that, we'll we'll robustly talk about that. Are there I guess um, are there other other tag members who who want to comment on the on the tag process before we open it up to everybody to comment on any proposals that they love or or don't like and why. Okay, um, I guess, why don't we start with our 406? Um, so Henry, are you, I wanna set up the context for this, but Henry, are you, are you around? There you are, okay. So the context for this is that the, the proposals are made to the council independent of other proposals. So there might be 10 proposals about one, one issue, and the R406 options table is where all of the things in the code kind of slam into each other. And so we had lots and lots of proposals about just the R406 table, but we also had proposals that require heat pump space heating and heat pump water heating that take options from the options table and make them required for all, all buildings under the code. And that changes how the options table works because now you, don't have certain options you had before. So changing the number of points to reflect the tags intent is has been what, what Henry has done. And then also modifying the table to pick up those two main proposals, this heat pump space heating and heat pump water heating, such that the R406 table is kind of what, what the tag intended um, when they voted for all these individual proposals. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Henry's a champion to take on all this work and try and do it rigorously and robustly. So thank you, Henry, and um, you have the floor to introduce what what modifications were made and why. Great, thank you, Chell. Um, yeah, so we had originally put out a R406 proposal that was based on the integrated draft <clears throat> that did include various uh, <clears throat> measures that had been in the R406 table, but were moved in the prescriptive code, namely some load reduction measures, uh, air tightness and insulated sheathing. Um, so those were included in our first draft. Um, the two major ones that did come in prescriptively that were pretty substantial was the heat pump water heating and heat pump space heating, which were both approved by the TAG. Um, and those had significant impact to section R406. Um, Historically, this section was the sole mover in the efficiency of the code. So this is kind of a new process for us to have to account for prescriptive updates while moving the R46 along. So 
there's a few pieces in this section, as Chell mentioned, that kind of causes things to smash together. Um, there's a site energy savings component through the traditional credit table. And then there's a fuel normalization table that uh, seeks to balance um, the carbon output of different uh, heating systems and fuel types. So once the uh, heat pump proposals were pushed through, that kind of changed the whole carbon balance of this section. Um, and also, you know, took some pretty substantial energy savings and put it into the prescriptive code. So I'll just summar summarize a few of the changes um, that were made. And Chris, I'll start from the easier ones and we'll just go down to the credit table. So scroll down R463. Yep. So <clears throat> lots of strike throughs here. The first two you'll see um, were taken out. Uh, windows, the U.28 windows are put in prescriptive code. So uh, once that kind of changed what the baseline envelope was, your UA, which is UA is for, you know, heat loss through a wall, um, the, the baseline in which to calculate what is an improved envelope changes. And so this is what you're seeing in the first couple sections. Um, really what happened is we had seven options in this um, envelope. Uh, grouping, but now we're down to four, and that's just because our prescriptive envelope's much better, um, and that'll apply to all houses, so um, just updates there. If you want to scroll down, um, that's the air tightness that was pulled in, so we lost a credit here, um, and then there's three more of beyond beyond the new 3ACH minimum. Uh, keep scrolling down. Um, so here, you'll notice 3.1 used to be basically what 3.2 is, where you just have a condensing fossil fuel boiler or furnace. Um, but since the new uh, heat pump space heating code went through, it's now evident that most um, gas use will, use will be in a supplementary um, scenario. And so uh, since the, the heat pump will meet load all the way down to roughly 38 Fahrenheit, the furnace wouldn't turn on till below that. And so there's fewer energy savings to be had there. And so that's why you see that clarifying sentence up at the top, which relates to the normalization table, which we'll check in on soon. And then D rates that um, credit to a half. 3.2 is put back in there. Um, it seems that there is means to use a boiler to meet your house load. And so we wanted to a address that in this table because uh, there are savings over a federal minimum piece of equipment and just not let that slip through if we keep scrolling down um, that's same as our proposal same with that one keep going um, this one there was a measure that was approved that to put air handlers inside the condition space um, air handlers are a significant source of the systems of the uh, air distribution systems leakage. So once that's put indoors, um, you've reduced a lot of the potential leakage. This measure originally had required the uh, <clears throat> unit to be placed indoors. And so what this D rate does, this 4.1 new one, is just cuts that in half to say now the builder just needs to put the ductwork in indoors, uh, which was not part of the prescriptive update. And if we keep scrolling down, that's unchanged. <clears throat> um, remove the gas water heating from these two options since uh, it's pretty clear that's a heat pump water heater. And then I don't believe there's any changes below this. The heat pump water heating credits did stay the same and that's due to some discrepancy between what a federal minimum requirement is, which is set on a 55 gallon unit versus the proponents proposal, which set it at a 20 gallon unit. Um, so it was hard to discern what the baseline uh, to honor in this section is. Um, and then the appliance was the same. So if you want to scroll back up to the um, fuel normalization table, one thing as we come out of this credit table, I'd originally proposed a third column for credit values. And that was based on between high energy use systems, um, AKA electric resistance and a gas system that cannot have a COP above one. And then um, 
heat pump systems, which have a higher efficiency. So if you have a system that uses a lot more energy to heat, um, load reduction measures are more impactful. But since we are down at a heat pump baseline, I took out that third column and just gave a single value for all other types versus R2. This is probably a good simplifying adjustment for builders and co-compliance. Um, another thing that happened with the energy table is, as I mentioned, there's several prescriptive um, envelope requirements that got moved out. The ducts inside got derated. The air tightness got derated. Even the, the credits for a higher efficiency heat pump were derated. And that's all because this table, the energy table is built off of a 2021 compliant home. So as, there, as that home uses less energy, the value of those credits also goes down. So the amount of available credits in R463 dropped compared to 2018. And that's kind of an important piece to remember when looking at the overall credit requirement. Um, another component of what this section um, requires in total, total credits is not just energy, but also this fuel normalization table. It originally was based off, well, first of all, the fuel normalization looks at uh, your space heating source, uh, furnace or heat pump or electric resistance or ductless heat pump or ductless heat pumps along with electric resistance. Uh, this also includes the accepted carbon emissions from different fuels that was sourced from the commercial code, which was approved. Uh, what that basically did is put the carbon emissions for electricity on a similar level to natural gas. Um, and so when you look at not only energy output, but the carbon output of two homes, that factor plays a big difference on how to get those two on level playing field. Um, and that's what this normalization table does. Since a straight furnace is likely um, very hard to accomplish with this new prescriptive code, we've set the baseline um, down to a dual fuel heat pump. Um, so that's where you're seeing a zero credit. And then the heat pump home uh, comes out with one and a half credits compared to that. And what you'll see if you compare this to our R406 proposal that was um, approved is we basically move that uh, baseline. So instead of, in the original proposal, we had the gas furnace was at zero, a dual fuel got you one and a half credits and a heat pump home got you three. So that's the system type one and two that we're looking at. So we basically slid that scale up. And so it's still the same differential between system types, but we're just kind of normalizing to lower point, um, lower points available. Um, and I'm primarily focused on single family homes when they talk about the zero and 1.5. Uh, now, if you want to scroll up, this is the, a little farther, this is the total mandated credits for the 2021 based on the new prescriptive updates. Um, they have gone down the three, six, and seven is what is currently required in the 2018 code. Uh, my original R406 proposal had increased all of these by two credits. So between what my proposal was passed as versus uh, this amended one is actually um, a two and a half to three point swing um, for small, medium, and large dwelling units. And it actually comes out to be less than what the 2018 code requires. And again, that's because there's been three or four prescriptive envelope requirements, um, which is roughly a credit and a half, um, as well as um, the ducks inside measure, and then <clears throat> the mandatory, I, I wouldn't say the heap of water heating really affected it because we're still giving the same credits as before. Uh, so it was really the uh, envelope credits and kind of the readjustment for um, a heat pump, uh, the heat pump, heat pump space heating requirement. So uh, that's a quick rundown of where we stand um, on a house to house basis. This is a uh, similar energy savings uh, between my proposal and this amended one based on the number of credits required. And that's when you look at, you know, what, how many credits you automatically get by putting heat pump in the home 
and then what is required beyond that, which includes HSPF 11 equipment or more insulation or um, even water heating. So did my best to make it comparative and to meet this cycle's um, energy saving targets. Thanks. Are credits still worth about 6%? <laughs> yeah, five to 6%. Um, it's becoming more on a percentage basis because that absolute value of kilowatts is dropping as I mentioned. Um, so, yeah. so this cycle we're saving 15-ish percent or something? That's the target, yeah. That's cool. And it's and that 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 number, that fifteen percent saving, is a house to house comparison. Um, once we do an overall review of the whole code and as well as the fuel mix and how people are complying, then we can get a better picture of how the whole state is moving towards the twenty thirty. But if you look at just a house versus house. Um, we're somewhere in that comfortable range of, you know, nine to maybe 15 is high, nine to 13 or 14. Thanks, Henry. That's that's a lot of work. And um, I guess there were, yeah. So this maintains the integrity of the, the integrity of the code savings, energy savings that the tag passed while incorporating the requirement for heat pump space heating and heat pump water heating and ACH3 instead of ACH5 and all the other things that the, the tag passed. So this is, I think, a, I think that this meets the intent of, uh, of the tag. Um, uh, I had a chance to review it before today and, and, and I think it, it generally meets that. Um, and then just, just to be clear, the, the, the tag passed one where the small, small dwelling unit was five credits, the medium was eight, and the large dwelling was nine. Um, but because of what, what other things the tag passed, the number of credits actually decreased. Um, just wanted to make sure that that was clear. And a big piece of that is just take a heat pump home and our original proposal got three credits coming out of the fuel normalization. And so if it was a medium house with a heat pump, you know, when we had it at eight credits needed, the fuel normalization would knock that down to five. Now you have a heat pump home, a medium sized house, you need five, your fuel normalization is actually taking it down to three and a half credits effective. Um, so you're getting, you know, a good uh, credit and a half to two credits that have already been pushed into the prescriptive code because uh, we've honored those uh, requirements already. Okay, um, and then just for the tags or, or the MBE committee's reminder, we so the the there's a, a linear path to the 2030 energy savings of 70 percent, and then there's a curved path, and the, the straight path is about eight percent absolute from the 20 2006 energy code to the 2030 energy code. Um, and the, the curved line is the, the smoother one. That's 14% per cycle going from, uh, that's just 14% from the previous like cycle to the next cycle. Now, the residential code is slightly behind um, the, the pathway there. So, um, so when I do the math on where we were and where we need to go, it's about 16% per cycle to get there. Um, but I think 15% or 14% or 16% are, are reasonably in, in the range of where we need to be. So, um, Larry. Uh, you know, Shell, you, you said that we were way ahead on the energy code already because we've had the 80, 20% shift from where we were from gas to electric. So I, I don't understand how we're going behind, but here's some calculations of what's going on. Last year in 2021, there was 26,610 new single Hamlet and duplexes built. And the energy uh, by switching those to uh, heat pumps is 191 megawatts of power. 
And to kind of give you an ID shell, because you lived in Spokane, upriver dam, that's six upriver dams uh, that would be required to supply this power. Then if we look, and we haven't talked about this lately at all, is what is going to be the impact of the heat that comes out from all these air conditioners? So when you run that number, we're at 745,880,000 BTUs of heat per hour coming from all these new air conditioners that you're adding on to the system that we haven't had before. And then finally, I've kind of set in the tag. I never applied to be a tag member because I wanted to see how this system worked since I've been gone for almost 15 years. And, uh, and here's what I see. I mean, we got this, the monopoly that's set up by city, Seattle City Power to run electricity, okay? They've kicked the gas out, so now they've made a monopoly in the city of Seattle for power. Then two of the people that sit on this commission, um, they work for the city of Seattle. And then on top of it, we've got two people pretty much that are from Ecotorp. And then we have Washington State uh, supported here in the commerce, they had a voting right. And so when you, if in some of these tags, when the person was involved with what was going on, they recused themselves, but that didn't happen in this energy tag. So, so what we have here is, is a city, city of Seattle energy uh, product that's been produced here and the governor. And, um, and, and I'm greatly disappointed. I mean, there was numerous attempts by the heating and gas industry to push this, to, to make some kind of compromise, but it wasn't done. And, the, and the, reason, the reason that we're all looking at this is because of all this energy that you're requiring. If you go in the Palouse and you see all the wind energy that Avista put in, that's only 50 megawatts, okay? So right now you, you would have to every year double the wind energy that Avista put up just to keep up with what you're doing. And it's not in the cards. We don't have this kind of power. And so we're gonna have more brownouts. And in, in the summertime, we can live with the brownouts, but in the wintertime, when everybody's got their electric on, they can't live with brownouts. Thank you. Hey, Jill, uh, there's not a chat, so I just let you know that um, I need to leave at 320. I apologize. Um, but if I may respond to a few of those points, I'm not sure, Larry, if you're talking about air conditioning, putting out heat or heat pumps, heating a house. Um, but if you light gas on fire, that also puts out heat and uh, the load's still the same. Uh, no, I'm talking about the air conditioning. The air okay. conditioning so market rate movement and also about your brownouts, that's a population growth. I don't think that no, that's uh, a population growth. That's a lack of energy because you're making a major shift from gas to electricity. You've you've shifted the load over here in, a, in the Avista area. We're 50 percent gas and 50 electricity percent electricity. When you think about what goes on in Seattle with all your high rises down there and everybody that's putting on the air conditioner, what do you think that happens to the outside? You got 120 degrees coming off most of those condensers and, and you're, you're, you're just raising the temperature outside more and more because you're bringing on more and more air conditioning. So it's no wonder why you guys are fighting a losing battle over there with the heat is because you expel it out of your buildings and you put it in the atmosphere outside. You're, you're making it even worse. The thing that you need to do is you need to reduce the load so you don't have so much air conditioning. That's, that's the problem of what's happened in this tag that's going on is we're not reducing the load. And that's the only thing we can do to curb really this thing. I think you okay. missed what I said was there's four load reduction measures that are now required across every single house. That's uh, two credits. Um, it's a lot of savings that were actually pushed through by the tag, which was quite a good move. Um, and I don't think you should take away from that. 
Well, I, I'm seeing a, a much greater use of electricity than what we've ever had in the past. And, it, and we're gonna pay for it. We're gonna pay for it for higher energy costs and we're gonna pay for it in the winter time when we don't have the power to run all this stuff. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Larry. Um, Damon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a lot of issues with this and uh, we'll need to go through it much more thoroughly, but um, the big one right off the top, if you'll scroll down just a little bit, please, for the first two items in the fuel normalization table. When we launched this code, the, the current version of the code, we realized that having gas backup versus electric resistance backup was advantageous. And uh, now we've penalized the gas backup. Um, so we're going to a less efficient measure and giving it a point and a half. So I would, I would strongly recommend eliminating one and just going with two for a point and a half. Thank you. Thanks, Damon. Uh, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've said this many times before in TAG meetings. Um, so members of the TAG that are um, present in those meetings are probably familiar with this, but um, we've been reminded as TAG members that all of these proposals should be assessed um, on their own merit, which is fair. However, I do believe that all of these proposals working together will have a real co cost implication on afford or on housing construction. Um, like I said before, we have 268,000 housing shortage um, in the state and $1,000 here and $1,000 there is just going to be passed on to people who are buying the, the homes that are built under this code. And so I would just like to remind everybody um, as you're assessing some of these things and as we're getting the economic analysis that's required by the APA that, that you know, I just need to remind everybody that the decisions that, we're, that you all are making are gonna have real life consequences on potential home buyers, first time home buyers, those looking, um, you know, to downsize, upsize, whatever their um, situation may be. And so to keep that in the back of your mind when you're passing some of these things, I think um, a lot of rules and regulations are well intended. However, they do have unintended consequences and that is something that should be um, assessed by the council at large. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Mike Wobliner. Thank you. Um Today's my last day at Washington State University. I've been there for 35 years in the energy program. Before that, the state energy office. Um, since I've been working on the code since 1986. So I'd appreciate about three minutes, if possible, to share my thoughts. I think that Henry's done a great job of taking a whole bunch of proposals and integrating them into 406 and addressing the fuel normalization credits. Um, I want to speak from the wisdom that um, I picked up from over 3,000 this year hotline emails and calls, as well as thousands of webinars that we've done in the last three years and, and my predecessors before me. Um, all the proposals that WSU have proposed, some accepted, some rejected, are based on real world experience, not just models of SEAM or other energy models. They're based on what it really happens when we talk with AHJs and builders and others. Um, they, they, all the proposals we've made truly seek to improve indoor air quality, durability, moisture, comfort, and distinguish between realized savings and modeled savings. It, they're really about the meter and the climate. Um, one other point, three, three point, OACH, which is what we're moving to and moving ducks inside the house is the most cost effective thing you can do. Well, it's hanging fruit. A lot of people are doing it. This is gonna help. So we're, better, we're basically building tighter. When you get the three ACH 50, you better make sure you're ventilating right. Proposals like we had that were rejected like the certificate, the option for 62.2 and others help ensure that in the real world, we're ventilating right. We've been doing research on indoor air quality and new construction for years. We know that, that we, do, we can do better in getting the operations of these systems, their maintenance, their commissioning. These seek, proposals seek to do that. Uh, I was disappointed they were rejected. Henry, 
excellent job again. Um, I had one comment on the tier three heat pump water heater uh, requirement for R3, excuse me, for R2. So when you, I, I, I propose that um, we reconsider or somehow figure out how to make heat pump water heaters work when they're unducted and put in each individual woody walk up or garden apartment without a corridor. Um, there has been, as far as I'm aware, no research done by the utilities or anybody on the use of these in that sector. Ecotope's done a hell of a lot of research in commercial multifamily integrated boilers that uh, heat pump water heaters that provide multiple apartments, but absolutely no research that I'm aware of that's been done that would, and I worry that people are gonna put these systems in and they're gonna be cold, they're gonna be noisy and they're not gonna run and the money could be spent on other energy efficiency so I'd ask you to consider the, the, that option of reducing the credits for that. Many builders don't do it because when they talk to the heat pump water heater manufacturers and say, hey, have you ever done it in multifamily? They say, hmm, good luck. Um, so I, Mike, I are you talking about a specific um, R406 option that we should be looking at while you're talking yeah, about well, it? Got, yeah, if you, if you move to the credits for tier three heat pump water heaters, and I apologize, I, I've been, I, I now am working at Oak Ridge National Lab, so I haven't been able to track all the work you're doing here. Um, keep going. Yeah, right there, you give 2.5 credits for R2. R2. And I think since we've moved uh, into the commercial code, central corridors, and all we're really talking about now for his, that, that column is Woody walk up garden style, that what you're doing is giving a lot of credit for somebody to put uh, something in a limited space. And, and we have seen no research or development or case studies by NIA or anybody that, that, that shown that there's realized energy savings. That's what I was talking about. I'll go on, just give me another two minutes and I'm good. Um, I think the other question I had for Henry was, uh, it looks like we've deleted the definition primary from the fuel normalization tables. And, and what we do in the energy code is to get a lot of questions on the hotline about dual systems, hybrid systems, somebody using a, uh, uh, two different types of fuels or two different types of equipment. Um, so I'm not sure what the implications are gonna be by deleting the term primary. We use primary okay, just to quite come, often. In the code just to answer code. that, I think it's because the, um, because the prescriptive code now requires the heat pump as the primary. I don't think primary is defined either. Yeah. That was an yeah. so, so right, that, I, Mike, I will have to go to another meeting. I apologize, Mike. I would like to address yeah, your comments. Yeah, we can take it offline, but good job on yeah. this. Um, so what I was clarifying here, let me give you a specific example, Chell. Um, space heating source is a, is a gas fireplace. If it's got any FE, it's uh, heating producing is, is, it, is this basically saying that even though you have a heat pump as the primary source, you're not allowed a gas fireplace? Anyway, that might be something that will come up as inter interpretation or issue. It's not a big deal, but I just wanted to point it out because I'm not gonna be able to be around much longer. Um, finally, I think it's really, really important that we look at um, the ERI proposal again. Um, I think that the IECC is moving to that. I believe that the trainers and listen to what Jonathan really is saying, the work he's done in quality assurance um, with the Raiders in Washington state, that are certified and trained, provides an outlet for the AHJs who are overworked and not having the time to assure that the realized energy savings is coming from what they see at plan review. The Raiders are value proposition for helping and giving the builder an opportunity to meet a tax credit and document for the IRS with approved models, the same thing that they can use and document to the state um, AHJ. Uh, the university WSU could easily incorporate that into the code compliance prescript, uh, uh, com code compliance, uh, compliance um, tool so that the AHJ wouldn't have to review anything. And Jonathan, I'll let Jonathan speak to that. Um, last but not least, I see that there's a 38 degree F lockout for backup gas. And again, this is one of those things of the real world versus what's on paper. Um, 
I haven't seen any knee evaluations in the last two real world evaluations that even looked at the lockout. But most of the research suggests that the heating contractors aren't locking it out. And what I know from building officials is they never check it. They used to be able to check it when it was an analog lockout in the outdoor unit. But now that it's embedded in the control strategy of the uh, heat thermostat, it's never checked. So make sure that the savings you're getting, that's assuming that this thing is gonna be locked out. Think about that. And then finally, um, I was a little disappointed that the, with the, the solution to helping with the lockout was the connected thermostats, EPA approved thermostats that uh, will ensure that the heat pump is operating at its op uh, and not the strip heat um, under optimal conditions and opens up an opportunity for uh, savings in, in, in platforms that are doing more than just space heating, water heating, the miscellaneous set of loads. I wanna thank everybody, you guys are great. It's been a pleasure working with you all and um, I'll just take it from there, thanks. Thanks Mike uh, for all your insight and your years and years of, of making the code better and helping people understand the code and get through it. So thank you for that. I, we had some specific comments from you and I wrote some of them down. Um, I Johnny had his hand up, but lowered it. So we'll go with Darren. Darren. So so I, I totally agree with uh, Mike one on his points. Um, I, I actually talked to Doug Llewellyn yesterday or two days ago, and I thought he was going to mention this when we get to the uh, de demand recirculation water systems. But I actually gonna, am going to propose a, I think, a solution to these issues in the future, because I have a 50 gallon storage water heater with a 220 volt shutoff timer and a recirc pump. And I save almost 2000 gallons of water a year with that. And the, the water heater's off 16 hours a day. So I think with that, I, I don't wanna get off topic what you're talking about, but you're talking massive electric savings, water savings. If 100,000 people did that, you'd have 182 million gallons of water saved a year for hydropower, salmon, everything. So anyway, I'm, I just wanna let you know I'm gonna propose that. I thought Doug was gonna mention it today um, along with the, research pump, but um, look in the future, I'm gonna propose that for half a credit in the energy code table, so thanks. All right, well, even though we're not quite done with this one, we'll start with the next one in not that long from now, so. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Scott. Uh, hey, Scott Peterson with the Northwest Gas Association. Uh, I was curious, um, given that the status quo, a lot of homes are built without air conditioning, um, so they might have a gas furnace or other um, electric heat, but no uh, summer air conditioning. By adding the heat pumps um, a, as a change from the status quo, you're going to add summer load that doesn't exist now. And, and I'm not making a comment on air conditioning. I'm all for it. Um, I'm just saying that in uh, everything I've read in I can't find where you're accounting for this new load, this new electric load in the summer by requiring, uh, by, you know, because, because the, the heat pumps of course come with air conditioning. And so are you chewing up your efficiency by adding new AC? Uh, and I, I don't have the answer, but I, I don't see it accounted for. So I'm asking the question. Okay. And I'll, I'll reflect what I what I heard at the tag on this issue is more of we're moving you know the rest of the country has air conditioning um, Washington Western Washington is one of the few areas where most new homes don't have air conditioning or didn't um, so there was kind of an acknowledgement by I think almost the entire tag if not the entire tag that air conditioning is being installed and if it's not installed as a central or a, or a system on day one, it will be installed in, um, in through wall air conditioners that are, that are not very efficient in general um, in the future. And so that would be a, a huge energy penalty. Um, and then also the acknowledgement that, you know, I've lived in Washington my, my entire life and the first smoke season that I experienced was in the last decade 
and now it's an annual thing. So from a health perspective, having air conditioning when you can't open the windows um, is, is an important part of, of how we adapt to climate change. And the fact that wildfire smoke is now a part of our state's air for a couple of weeks a year, if, if not longer. Um, so I, that's, that's what I heard the tag say about this is not so much that we want people to have air conditioning, but that people are installing air conditioning in many cases, in most cases. And so that's, that's kind of just how builders are doing things and how uh, homeowners want, want things. So, um, now, I guess, I guess the point is, it's a net, uh, don't get me wrong, it's a net positive good. I, using energy actually generally is, a, is good. It means people are doing something good in their lives. My point is, you're not accounting for, you're making a change that's going to increase load. And, and I, I'm making the assumption that means decrease efficiency. And it, it, to be scientific, air quotes, it seems like you should account for that uh, and you're not that that's the only point i'm making i i think it's ac is great being able to close your windows in the summer especially during smoky season net good but you you're not i guess my point is in my opinion you're not being honest about what these changes mean to uh overall load Joe, may i speak to that please please henry yeah yeah, so uh, actually the Washington State's already 88% saturated with heat pumps per NIA's recent report, and that happened underneath the 2018 code. So that switch has already happened outside of this. What this would do is might push it a little bit closer to 100%. Uh, so with any heat pump uh, comes AC. So that load, which you're speaking of for new construction only, has largely been introduced. Um, from modeling, uh, total cooling energy on an annualized basis is roughly... 600 kilowatt hours in Spokane and maybe 350 in Washington and Seattle. Um, so, and that's compared to a heating load, heating energy use of 4,700 kilowatt hours and 2,300 kilowatt hours. So vastly more heating energy spent um, in our state across the board. And our modeling analysis does use uh, both gas furnaces, gas furnaces with air conditioning, electric resistance and central heat pumps as a saturation across the state and then weighs all that back down to give a representative number. So we're, we have accounted for it. The cooling load is growing, but per Nia's report that's already been introduced um, in the last three years. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Carolyn. Hi. Um, yeah, on behalf of Northwest Carthage, you address something that Alan kind of nagging at me when we're talking about space heating. Um, gas fireplaces have not been discussed as being limited in this re respect. So I want to make sure that when we're talking about these efficiency requirements and space heating in the context of these proposals, that we are talking about the actual furnace and the primary sources um, as opposed to a gas fireplace. Um, I, I think that's really important. And then just you know, on behalf of Washington Air Conditioning Contractors Association, based on our previous conversations, and I think also what we heard earlier today, we need to make sure we've built in some mechanisms, um, making sure we have enough options in case what we're asking for in this code is not available in the marketplace when we actually come down to permit these homes. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. And would, were you making a specific, there was someone earlier who suggested that the, an initial space heating type of a of a gas fireplace should be in the options table. And I guess I'm not familiar with that many homes whose primary heat source that you know that doesn't have a a heating source it other is. than that. So is that yeah is it that is rare. It is rare for gas fireplace to be the primary. You do have I mean, I, they, it's used sometimes for individual and zonal heating occasionally, but it's rarely a primary heat source. So I guess, are you suggesting a change to this table or? Um, I don't know. I'd have to take a look at it. I'm going to go back and ask the technical people. And so hopefully I have an answer by Friday. Okay. And if not, there's a, a long public comment process after that as well. So, um, uh, Corey. 
Thanks, Jill. I'm 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 late for my three thirty. I'm just asking for help if we need to do something in uh, another part of the meeting. It's just regarding that appendix L not being adopted. Can somebody make a motion and send it to the council with whatever we need to do? Yeah, and the idea is that you want uh, appendix L to be sent to the IMC or the the, the sorry the the plumbing tag. Well, we want to be able, I think we have to put it in our code if we're going to reference it, right? Yeah. And I don't know what the process is for that. And so um, yep. anyway, if you can help me, because I have to go. Yeah, I will. Um, Thank you. Krista, is it as simple as putting it as a reference in at the end of the energy code, like all the references to ASHRAE and AHRI standards? Is that, is it as simple as that? They would still need to get uh, approval from the local jurisdiction to use it, but also remember that it is already included in the commercial energy code. Appendix that L. That table is in there wholesale. So. Um, I guess that's my question. If it's not adopted by the state in the UPC, can they still reference it? I don't see anything that would prevent them from referencing it. However, as I said, the uh, AHJ would still have to approve its use. Since it's an appendix that is uh, at the jurisdiction's uh, approval of the use of a, an appendix. A jurisdiction can a, use any appendix that they want if they adopt it. Well, unless it's residential and then there are some hoops. Hey, Corey, what if you, what if you and I take this offline and try and figure out- Okay, I just want to, if something had to happen today, I just wanted somebody to do the motion because I got to go. But anyway, thank you for your time. Okay, I will send you an email and we can we can talk about it and because I, I don't know what to do either. Thank so. you. Okay. Note to self. Okay, um, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, a, a comment and a question. Uh, there was a mention of a NIA report that has been uh, mentioned a few times, both in the tag and in this meeting, that uh, <laughs> if you read it, you might conclude that 88% of homes aren't built with, with gas in Washington. However, we've talked to folks at NIA and one of the co-authors of that paper, and that is a very preliminary study. It, it was never intended to inform policymaking. It was really just for NIA to get a, a finger wag. It's, it's, a study is being done, but it, that, these are not final results. And they would have requested that it not be used for policymaking. So I would just like to clarify the record on that. And then a question, um, it's, this meeting is due to end in less than 30 minutes. Uh, wondering if now is the time to bring up concerns with other proposals or if we're still going to settle on this one for the remainder of the time. Well, I can't hear you, Shell. Yeah, I guess while we're on this one, I would like to deal with it or at least make a recommendation to the, the council uh, on this particular uh, attempted um, attempt to kind of coalesce multiple proposals into a into a something that could go into the uh, CR 102 so that council doesn't need to consider all the discussion we've already had today. So I, yes, I, I'd like to dispatch with this one um, before we move on to other things. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And Scott, you have your hand up still. Or yeah, I just wanna, Henry mentioned the NIA study and I just wanna men, just reiterate what Kevin just said, that the, that 88% not numbers based on a non-representative quick survey of some builders 
and does not reflect what's happening in Washington state. So I just wanna just, so hence thus, uh, the uh, AC load in the summers it, that these heat pumps are gonna add is not accounted for. And so you hitting your 15% target because of this, is you're, it's not happening. Even if it's good, it's not happening. That's the only point I wanna make. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, I guess, yeah, my understanding from the tag is that people are installing air conditioners. So we, yeah. Um, so that's, it's, it's yeah, okay. Uh, Mike Lovelinier. Yeah, in, res in regards to the last two comments, again, from the perspective of talking to 3,000 people on the hotline and the trainings that we do, the, I th and I, I don't want to get into the politics of what's availability of NIA's um, report, but I can tell you that most of the builders and the folks that uh, since 2018 with those credits are moving to heat pumps. And part of the way that they sell that over gas is that a heat pump, a high efficiency heat pump is comparably priced once you look at the alternative being an AC coil and a gas furnace and the builders and then the infrastructure for bringing the gas in. So I think that, that there is other anecdotal information from our experience on the energy tag that suggests that whether it's 88 or 80 or 75, it's a significant change. And the reason is those two reasons. And also it was 112 degrees for a week in Olympia last year and folks in the market is seeing that that's gonna be a trend in the future, plus the wildfires that somebody mentioned. So I think it is, um, it'll be interesting to see if Nia publishes that, but I, it is consistent with what we hear in the trenches on the hotline. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, Larry. Okay, uh, Caroline. Thanks. Yeah, I just um, really um, appreciate the, the comments on this report. I do think it's a piece of information that has been referred to a lot and just, you know, looking three sentences into the executive summary, you know, it does imply the purpose of this was to understand how builders are complying with the code, identify trends and gather builder feedback to guide development of energy code proposals for consideration by the Washington State Building Code Council. So if they, you know, perhaps no longer feel that way, or if there's something about this um, that should be shared, that would that would be really useful information. Um, so that was one thought. Um, yeah, I think the the only other comment I want to bring up, I think Henry has done an amazing job correlating all the proposals in a short amount of time to um, piece back together the the R406 table so that it aligns with all the TAG approved um, proposals. And I think just wanted to point out that, you know, before he did that, the TAG had also passed a different version of this R406 table um, that would also achieve the energy savings. So I think it's one of the interesting things the TAG has talked about throughout the process, just that there's multiple pathways to get to the goal at the end of the day. And I think, um, all of the options and all of the pathways, you know, I really appreciate Todd's comment about there being a, a, a propensity to lean towards getting more, more comment on options and ideas. So just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, Larry. Yeah, probably unless you're into a more expensive home, the the medium sized smaller homes over here they don't come with air conditioning shell i mean that's an ad okay and you can go out and look at the track homes they don't have air conditioning in them okay so that is an extra amount of energy that that we're putting forth that we haven't put forth before over here in this area even though it does get hot uh, a lot of people are able to get by and the reason why they get by a lot of them is because of how well the houses are insulated now okay and that really helps the more insulation we can put in the less cooling we need the less heating we need thank you 
Thanks, Larry. And yeah, we have lots more envelope things in the code this cycle. So that's um, that's good for the long-term viability of, of, but, of energy. One other thing though, Shell, we've reduced quite a bit of what we had options. I think we should have, for every option that we lost, we should have came up with an envelope option to replace it with. Because as a builder, if you're out here building this, I think we lost seven, eight options at least, maybe 10. And um, so that that makes it a lot less to pull from. And and I think we should have should have had more envelope options that would have picked these up. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Okay, so I think this is probably time to figure out what we want to do with this this um uh this r406 uh proposal or we could so i guess i i'd like to see a motion on this uh to either approve it sug or suggest something else regarding the modified r406 table Take your time. Um, we we need to move forward into the public process, into a another public process, and we need something to be the language that goes out as far as the CR one hundred two, so um, that people can react to, and we can make substantial changes after that. We go, or we can make noticeable changes after that. So. Um, yeah, we need to figure out how to move forward so we can recommend something to the council. Uh, go ahead, Katie. Um, so just to be clear, and I'm sorry if this is off, but Fine. Um, so this is what we're talking about specifically is which one of the things on this list of the, I mean, I, I have okay. it pulled up here yeah. and would it replace all the other 406s that are there? Like, what does it, yeah, so this is um, the what we see in front of us is a method of integrating the R four six table that was part of um, proposal O seven three, um, integrating that with other proposals that were passed, including the. Um, Air infiltration testing proposal go, went from five to three. The space heating heat pump proposal that, that passed the tag, the heat pump water heating proposal, and a few of the other proposals that went for R406. Now, this, this doesn't comprehensively go through every proposal that affected R406, uh, but it does go through the major ones. And that was what the ask was for Henry was to go through and integrate the major ones into the R406 table such that it meets the energy efficiency targets and um, but with all those other pieces integrated into it with numbers of points and redoing the energy modeling on a lot of this so that it so the number of points reflect the actual energy savings. Yeah, so it's kind of an integration piece that would I think there's some R406 options that are it would still need to be integrated into this proposal 073 um, and staff can do that. Um, but the major pieces that staff cannot do have been done in this revised uh, 073. So we, sense. yeah, so we, we wouldn't, we still wouldn't be able to take some of this other stuff off of this list. Is that right? Or well, so, so the process is we would, each of these is, is a standalone piece right now. Yeah. And so we could strike any of them or, or, or resuscitate one that was just approved and move that onto the council. And the council could do the same thing. But when the council gets finished with it, it will go out into the CR 102 as a body of text sure. okay. that, that is out for public comment as the code. And then that would attract public comment, and then the council would deliberate on that um, 
public comment. Okay. Okay, uh, Jay. Thank you. I think you've answered this this question in in that last discussion, but it sounds like what you're asking about is what version of 073 that we want to move forward. And the what I heard was that even though the tag had a modified version of this, this the version that Henry talked about that was separately listed in our packet was updated to correlate all the other changes that were put in there. And so given that if we were going to move forward with all the other tag recommended changes, we should take this version of 7.3. And so whether we, um, you know, given we've got 10 minutes left, um, I, I would um, say that um, first that we should be moving this entire package up forward as recommended by the tag for public comment. And then we can take that public comment and, and go through that process. And if we're going to do that, we needed the updated correlated version from Henry on 7.3 and would support uh, doing that. But I think we have to make sure that we want to move this full package forward as kind of the threshold question. Thank you. Yep. So, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think you're, I, I want to be careful. I think 073 revised includes almost all R406 changes, but not all. It, but it's more current, more accurate than the tag recommended version of 7th, correct? Yes, because it, well, it's, yeah, yes, because it incorporates other things that the tag passed that the tag did not necessarily at the same time correlate. So, yes, it's, it's updated to reflect other tag intents within it. Yep. Okay, Todd. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I think, I think I'm aligned with Jay and I'm ready to move forward, but I, I think I would ask if, if you or Carolyn or, or someone um, more closely aligned with the tag could, could make the, could recommend the, the motion to make sure that we properly incorporate uh, these, these amendments in the motion. Okay, well, Caroline is up after Matt, so she will have opportunity, Matt. Yeah, I'm just, I was just circling back to and the, the comment, I think Caroline brought it up about HSPF2, and, and as I'm attentively listening for comments about that and the changes that are, you know, as I navigate the next six months, just I'm wondering if that we are addressing it in, in any of the changes uh, in the next six months, um, and just whether that, maybe I'll have to do some more research, but uh, that'll be important for my my planning. Okay, thanks, Matt. And since this, my understanding of that issue is that it occurs January 1, 2023 to, to middle of 2023? No, it's, it's, it's January 1 of 2023, and they're basically going to come out with they're going to list an HSPF, and then they'll also have this HSPF two, and some of the requirements. Um, so I'm just trying to see what it, what are the codes, how's the code going to address it, and our rebates. So yeah, so so Matt, I guess that is either an emergency rule if if it rises to that, or it's an opinion of the Building Code Council. And why don't you email Krista and I after this, and we can discuss what that means because that doesn't the 2021 code will not be affected by the time period January 1, 2023 to July of 2023. That the 2021 code has no jurisdiction in that time period. Right. So there's yeah, and it gets complicated, but like there's some SEER 2. SEER 2 is not going to make some certain requirements where I will yep. have certain minimums that I can't even get to or even order. Um, okay. but, so maybe it doesn't affect it, but it certainly might put another number out there. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you know Krista and I, and we will attempt to figure out what what remedy is the best remedy. Oh, there, and I'm looking at somebody's. Sound good? We yes. We have only a few minutes left. And I want to make sure that we are able to dispatch with this and, and uh, saying or, or extend the meeting. So Caroline. Thanks, Joe. Um, 
Okay, I'd like to make a motion to move forward um, the tag actions, which includes the um, original version of the R406, so this 073 we've been talking about, but I'd also like to move forward the version um, that was just posted this morning, I think in the spirit of um, getting more input and having more options, I think this is that appropriate stage in the process to leave all of those on the table. That is my motion. Okay, and I guess just to clarify the motion, the motion is to include in our recommendations two options for the R406 table. Correct. Okay, so, Yep. Okay. So option one would be the probably the original R46 stage and option two. Is there any hierarchy or preference or like recommendation between the two? Or I guess it's just two options, two equal, equal footed options. Sure. All all options. Okay. All right. So we have a motion on the table, and I'm going to restate the motion um, is to forward the tag recommendations. Um, as they were, you know, in the, in the meeting documents today, with two options for the R406 table, one of which was the as modified uh, that was passed by the tag, and the other being the 073 that was um, submitted this morning to the MBE committee. So that's the motion. Is there a second for that motion? It's Todd, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Jay. Just a question for Caroline. Uh, Caroline, um, is, is your reason for putting both forward just uh, the fact that the tag had vetted the original proposal versus us just seeing the updated one? Yeah, I think that's certainly part of it. I think it also just lends um, more flexibility as we move forward. We don't necessarily know what's going to happen with all of these proposals. And so having um, more of them move forward in the CR2, I think gives more flexibility into how they ultimately come together. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, we are ready to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. We uh, passed the the um, the motion uh, unanimously. The next agenda item is other business. Um, since we dispatched with a request for emergency rule, I guess Greg, are you still on the phone? Yeah, I am here. I forgot. I guess before we we looked at that motion to. Uh, in, to make sure we talk to you about it because um, I'm just seeing my notes now. Uh, proposal 024 um, included some clerical language on one of the proposals and Greg was the, Greg wrote that clarifying language. And so, um, Greg, do you wanna spend a minute introducing it? Yep, it'll take me a minute or two and I'll be done. Um, the first thing is, I think this is actually going to align well with what the Washington ACA is suggesting in their last bullet point to go with the cold climate heat pumps, 10 HSPF. <clears throat> when we went through the proposal 024, um, the tag made a modification to require cold climate heat pumps for winter design temperatures 23 degrees Fahrenheit or below to claim the 11 HSPF energy credit and allowed a relaxation to 10 HSPF when using a neat cold climate heat pump. The relaxation in HSPF is designed to encourage the use of cold climate heat pumps where appropriate and eliminate supplemental heat systems. When we had all the discussions on um, O24 and the tag, we didn't allow the cold climate heat pumps in areas over 23 Fahrenheit to take the credit. Um, and in alignment with what, um, 
Washington ACA is suggesting. I think it's a really good move to allow 10 HSPF heat pumps anywhere that are on the neap cold climate list. Um, we get a lot of get rid of a lot of strip heat, and we also expand the options there. So I put some suggested language in there that Chell and Krista have um, that would supersede the original one that the tag passed. And um, I'd like to put forward that we adopt that to supersede the original 024. Well, Caroline, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to chime in. I think this makes a lot of sense. I think the cold climate heat pumps are a great benefit to um, climate zones that don't design quite down that low. So, so this idea. Great. I will entertain a motion to include this language in the previously uh, in in our recommendations to the council for proposal 024. Is anyone so moved? I'll move that. Okay, we have a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second to include the revised language um, that Greg sent in uh, in the package we sent to the council. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes uh, unanimously. Um, and we are out of time. Um, I do want to encourage those those other conversations to happen. So um, let's please send me an email about the HSPF2 and we'll figure out the right the right way to, to tackle that one. Um, other than that, is there other business? Okay, we are adjourned. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care, everyone. Stay happy and healthy. <laughs>